Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm that one guy for never and today I have a special grounded video for you. We're going to be taking a deep dive into Grounded's combat system and breaking down all of the non-boss creatures in the game and how to defeat them. The length of this video, I realize, is going to be a little daunting for most of you. Don't worry, I don't expect you all to watch the video in its entirety. I've set up convenient timestamps for each creature, so feel free to jump to whatever bugs are giving you the most trouble. Before you do that, though, listen to this next bit first. These videos take me a very long time to produce with my health, and during this process, the developers have made a number of tweaks and changes to the combat system that I really need to go over with you first before you skip ahead. The most important changes came with the 1.1 update. All of the weapon specific mutations have been completely reworked. Before, most of these were terrible and hardly worth a mutation slot. Now, almost all of them are not only viable, but should be prioritized in most combat situations. So when you're watching this video and I'm making mutation suggestions, just keep in mind that my new recommendation is to turn on your weapon specific mutation. That means if you're using a slashing weapon like the Coltana, you'd turn on Blade Master. The Rusty Spear, you'd turn on Javelinier. The Widow or Spider Dagger would be Assassin, so on and so forth. Another important change is the new Marking Foe system. The developers have now given you some real incentive to decorate your base with those wall trophies. You see, you can go up to your wall trophy, and you'll notice that you're prompted to click on it to mark foe. This grants you and your team 20% bonus damage on that creature for 15 minutes. You can only have one of these active at a time. They do not stack. When you click on another trophy and mark another foe, instead it simply rewrites the last one. This is an amazing change that will help both casual and hardcore gamers alike. Any creature that you struggle to take down, you should prioritize making a trophy from their parts as soon as possible and marking that foe before you go hunting. Just think of how useful this is going to be for tougher enemies like the Mantis or Broodmother, or even Wolf Spiders, Ladybirds, or Blackhawks Beetles. The last change I need to address is the new respawn system. When your character dies, the game now gives you a new option for respawning at a nearby field station. This is a fantastic change. It's going to cut down on your need to make lean-tos everywhere. So if I say in this video to set up a lean-to before a fight, just know this is less important than it was before. Of course, the new respawn system isn't going to help you if you haven't discovered a nearby field station, so make sure you're exploring and finding all those that take advantage of this. There have been a lot of other changes too. Rebalancing of weapons and armor perks, stamina cost on non-perfect blocks, reworks on other mutations, but most of these feel intuitive and don't largely change the combat meta. Before we jump into each individual bug, I want to cover some general combat tips that are going to help you out in any encounter. First, if you weren't aware of it, you can change your perspective from first person to third person by opening up your radial menu with LB on Xbox and selecting the top option. PC players, you can simply just hit U to switch views. Now I know everyone has their preferences, but if you're one of those people that struggles with combat, I highly suggest turning on third person mode for melee combat and first person mode for ranged bow combat. Why? Well, when you're in melee combat, third person mode is going to give you a wider camera angle on your surroundings. It makes it easier to see what your enemy's doing, and you can tell if more enemies are coming to flank you from your side or behind. In general, it just makes combat feel less chaotic. For bowmen, First person mode is better because it's easier to see your crosshair and you're more zoomed in on your opponent. Another major tip is to fight defensively. Most fights are going to be much easier if you fight this way. But what does that mean in practice? Basically, when you're fighting, you should have a blocking phase, then a brief attacking phase, then back to blocking. Most enemies are programmed to fight in a very simple fashion. They will attack, then do nothing, leaving a window for you to attack, and attack again, infinitely repeating this over and over. So with the help of this guide, you're going to be learning each enemy's attack animations and tells. Get familiar with that, and you're going to know exactly when you can safely attack. 
My final tip, if a particular bug is giving you a hard time, or if combat is just difficult for you, try using a one-handed weapon combined with a shield. The shield is a godsend. Even the most basic tier 1 weevil shield is good. You see, when you block, normally, if it's not a perfect block, your weapon will reduce that damage by a set percentage. But, if you're using a shield, that shield will instead take the damage of an imperfect block. So really, all you need to do is hold up that shield until the enemy's done attacking, and you're going to be perfectly fine. Yeah, after the shield takes so much damage, it will leave you temporarily stunned. But this stun is almost always short enough that you'll have plenty of time to pull up the shield again before your enemy's next attack. Alright guys, be sure to click that like and subscribe button, it really helps my channel out. Let's jump into the creatures. Feel free to jump around to whatever bugs are giving you the most trouble. Spiderlings have no weapon weakness, and they're weak to spicy like most spiders, however they do resist stabbing and fresh. In truth, elements aren't going to be very useful to you guys until the mid game, you're not going to have access to them without the Black Ant Hill super chip, or unlocking certain hidden weapons. So let's just focus on damage types for the early enemies. Armor isn't particularly important, but acorn armor will help a lot. These buggers are fast, so you need a quick weapon like the Peblet Dagger or Peblet Axe. They only possess one attack, a charged lunge, which they telegraph by leaning backwards and then thrusting forward. This can be perfect blocked just as the Spiderling lunges forward. General tips for Spiderlings is to fight aggressively, but not so much so that you run out of stamina. Spiderlings are found in packs and can quickly overwhelm you, so killing them as quickly as possible is important to surviving. Larvae have no weapon weaknesses, but are weak to spicy and resist chopping. Larvae are extremely aggressive and have very fast attack combos, therefore you will want a tanky armor like acorn armor. For your weapon, I suggest a Peblet Spear for its quick attack animations and range. Any quick weapon besides an axe will do fine as well. Larva possess three attacks. The first is a long distance lunge attack. So back up, then rear back, and lunge at the player for a deceivingly long distance. This can be perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the larva lunges forward. The second is a side swipe attack. This is a one-hit attack where the larva pivots backwards and slightly to the side and then lunges at the player. This too can be perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the larva lunges. The third is a three-hit combo. The larva pivots strongly to the side and lunges at the player, but this time executing a three-hit combo, attacking side to side and then from straight back. The first two hits are performed with the same timing, but the final hit has a slight delay. The timing for the perfect block is the same as the other attacks, block just as the attack is coming at you. If you perfect block any hit during this combo, the combo will be cancelled out due to the knockback. Occasionally, the larva will change things up and cancel the final attack, making it a two hit combo. Because of their aggression and large damage output, players should avoid taking on multiple larvae at one time. Try to use your bow to pull one larva at a time as they do tend to be in packs. Fight defensively, blocking as best as you can and then punishing with a few attacks and then going back on the defensive. Keep a close eye on your stamina and don't be afraid to pop a smoothie if you begin to take too much damage. Red soldier ants are weak to stabbing and spicy and have a weak point on the eyes, but they resist chopping and slashing. Soldier ants generally hit slow but hard, so you need a good armor like acorn or grub. Be sure to take advantage of their weakness by bringing a spear, even the basic peblet spear is sufficient. Because the ant hills have so many ants, a little more prep is needed here. I recommend packing bandages and at least a stack or two of smoothies or roasts for healing. Don't forget to set up a lean-to in the area nearby in case you die. Another very useful but underutilized item is the Shinobi Sneeze. We'll talk more about this soon. 
If you have it, activate the Ant Annihilator mutation for more damage and more damage resistance against ants. They possess two attacks. The first is a charged bite, which is only performed at short range. The soldier will pull back his head and hiss before slightly lunging forward with a strong attack. This hiss is delayed, so pay attention, looking for the soldier to shake his head, indicating the attack is incoming. This can be perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the soldier lunges forward. The second attack is an aggressive charged lunge, which can be made into a three hit combo. This attack is better telegraphed. The soldier will hiss, lean back before lunging with a slight delay. The first attack hits particularly hard and is occasionally followed up with two very fast side swipes. It's best to perfect block the initial hit blocking the moment the soldier lunges forward. If you miss the first attack, don't panic, but begin flicking block immediately to try to perfect block the next two attacks. Any perfect block during this combo will cancel the combo thanks to the knockback. When possible, soldier ants can be made much easier by pulling a single ant from the colony. Try to do this by attacking with your bow and cutting it far away from its allies. Due to the sheer number of ants, things are inevitably going to go wrong and you will be attacked by multiple enemies. Don't panic. Take them backwards while attacking to minimize being hit by multiple enemies at once. Keep a close eye on your stamina and use smoothies or roasts to heal as needed. If things get too overwhelming to handle, this is where the Shinobi Sneeze is useful. Make sure that this item is in your hotbar and use it to momentarily cause the enemies around you to de-aggro, giving you time to make your escape and regroup. Orp Weaver Juniors are probably the hardest tier 1 monster. Unless you're confident in your skills, I would hold off fighting these until you have an ant club or similar hard hitting tier 2 weapon. Orp Weaver Juniors are weak to spicy, resist stabbing, and fresh, and are completely immune to poison. They are agile and hit deceptively hard, and unlike their full grown version, they can poison you. So you're going to need some heavy armor like Acorn and a strong hitting weapon like the Ant Club to end the fight as soon as possible. The longer the fight drags on, the more likely you are to get poisoned. This is another fight that I suggest some prep work. Bandages, roasts, or smoothies are very helpful if things get out of hand, especially if you get poisoned. Juniors possess the same moveset as the adult Orb Weavers. However, their small size can make it difficult to read their tells. Their first attack is a jump attack. This move is well telegraphed, it lowers its head, and then sits back raising its front legs, and after a brief delay, will jump in the air towards the player inflicting heavy damage and a chance of inflicting poison if not perfect blocked. This move can be used at both close range and long range, but when the player is at long range this move is typically prioritized. To perfect block this attack, wait for the spider to start jumping in the air and block at that very moment. The second attack is a side swipe. Depending on your position, the junior will either lean back or towards its side and swipe at you with a moderately damaging attack. Perfect block this attack by blocking at the moment it lunges at you. The final attack is its most devastating, a three hit combo. It always starts this attack by leaning towards your right side, then sideswiping you from the right, half a second later biting you from your left, and then raising itself up, lunging at you with a heavy bite attack that is slightly delayed. The final attack has a chance to poison you. This is where perfect blocking starts to get a little harder, as this combo cannot be cancelled, meaning you need to perfect block all three hits. This isn't as hard as it sounds though, as the monster's timing is very forgiving. The first two hits, you need to block just as the attack is coming at you. These first two attacks are timed in perfect rhythm, making it easy to get this timing down. For the final attack, pay close attention to the junior, trying not to block too early as this attack is delayed. 
As with most bugs, try to pull only one Orb Weaver Jr. at a time with the help of your bow. Things get very overwhelming when you have multiple spiders on you at once. I recommend popping a bandage before you start the fight for slow health regen. Fight defensively, focusing hard on getting blocks or perfect blocks in. Only attack after the spider has finished its own attack, and if you are using a slow swinging weapon like the Ant Club, only attack twice unless you just perfect blocked. If things start to get sketchy or you get poisoned, focus on healing up after the enemy's attacks. Now, if you're finding the Orb Weaver Juniors to still be too difficult, this would be a good time to make yourself a shield and buy the mutation Meat Shield from Burgle. Diving Bell Spiders are weak to salty and slashing, but resist fresh and stabbing. When it comes to underwater creatures, you need to take into account your limitation on weapons. Only spears and daggers work underwater. You can fight the Diving Bell Spider with a Peblet Dagger, but they're so fast you almost need to use your Peblet Spear for the range, until you unlock the Bone Dagger or Bone Trident that is. The choice is yours. There's a couple other factors that make this enemy a little troublesome. Because you're underwater, you can be attacked from any direction, making it extra difficult to lure out a single bell spider. You're also not wearing as much armor, because the guild tube or bubble helmet is almost mandatory for underwater combat. Not to mention, many will also wear the fin flips, drastically reducing your protection. Thankfully, the diving bell spider has a very simple moveset that is predictable. It only has one single attack, an overhead lunge. It will growl, and then raise its front legs before pouncing at the player. This attack has substantial range and is very difficult to avoid, so it's best to block. The perfect block timing is a little tricky on this one, as it depends on your distance from the enemy. If you're close, block the second you see the spider lunge forward, if you're further away, you should wait a split second until the attack is slightly closer to you. Once you get the timing down with blocks, or even better, with perfect blocks, this enemy becomes no big deal. Just make sure not to get surrounded by multiple spiders, and heal with smoothies or roasts as needed. Fireflies are weak to stabbing, but resist spicy. No particular armor is required for this fight, but you will want to be quick on your feet to kite the enemy. That's why I recommend Aphid Slippers and or the mutation Natural Explorer, which makes you run faster. For a weapon, I prefer a good bow and spear, preferably tier 2. The Firefly only has one attack, a Bioluminescence Bombardment attack. When the firefly begins to descend to the ground, it will curl its abdomen inward and begin shaking it before discharging an explosion of bioluminescence. This attack hits pretty hard and is unblockable, but thankfully you can easily dodge it if you see it coming. Kiting the firefly is the name of the game here, preferably with a bow. With the quick equipment I recommended, you can easily outrun the firefly by backing up continuously. Just make sure you're not backing up into the water or into a nest of mosquitoes or larvae. If you prefer melee, it is possible, although harder. My best advice is to wait for the firefly to begin to descend, jump attack, get in a single hit and run, or wait for its bioluminescence bombardment, and then jump into the fray to get in an attack or two. This method is going to take longer. Orb Weavers are weak to spicy and resist fresh and stabbing. They are agile and hit moderately hard, so tanky armor like Acorn is recommended. The most viable weapon at this time is going to be the Red Ant Club. Well, upgrading your Ant Club to plus one or plus two is very helpful. Some general prep is recommended. Bandages, smoothies, or roasts. If you know you're going to be taking on a whole nest of Orb Weavers, I strongly suggest starting to craft meals for their powerful buffs. Mite Loaf is particularly inexpensive and offers a powerful buff, reducing your stamina consumption per attack. This can be a lifesaver when you'd normally overcommit and need more stamina to defend an incoming attack. 
As for smoothies, Green Machine or Fuzz on the Rocks are always helpful. The Orb Weaver has the exact same attacks as the Orb Weaver Jr. However, they cannot poison. In return, all their attacks hit harder. Well, actually, they do have one new attack, and that's a web sling. When at long range, the Orb Weaver will hiss, rearing back before shooting a web projectile at the player. If this hits you directly or the ground where you're standing, the player will be trapped inside of this web and will need to attack several times to escape. If the web misses, a web trap will be left in the spot that it hit. The only other thing you need to watch out for is the three hit combo, as the Orb Weaver can choose on the third attack to delay it or execute it immediately. Pay close attention. This may seem crazy to some of you, but I find Orb Weavers to be the best enemy to practice and perfect perfect blocks. I often train new players on them, instructing them to only block and never attack. This may seem intimidating at first, but I promise you perfecting this enemy will make most of the game a lot easier. The Ruzz T, Tasty, and Arker are all very similar, so I'm going to cover them all at once. All of them are 50% weak to Sour and Busting, 25% weak to Salty and Generic, Generic is weapons like the Red Ant Club. Additionally, they're all 50% resistant to Chopping and Stabbing, and 25% resistant to Slashing. They're completely immune to Shock, Bleed, Gas, and Poison. These enemies aren't particularly challenging, but they can hit pretty hard if you give them the chance. What does make them tough, though, is that you're generally going to find them in the labs where they're always grouped up. It's best to go in prepared, so let's talk prep. Armor-wise, this is largely going to depend upon what lab you're going into, but for any of the first three, Hedge, Haze, or Black Ant Lab, you should try to use the best armor you can at the time, ideally Tier 2, something like Spider, Ladybug, Koi, or even Bee Armor for Bowman. For weapons, Sour isn't going to be a thing for you for a long time, so I'd focus on exploiting their other weaknesses. Early on, the Ant Club is one of the best choices, but the Insect Hammer is even better. If you've made it as far as the Black Ant Lab, the Salt Morningstar is especially effective, inflicting 75% additional damage against them. For the first two labs, the Hedge and Pond, upgrading your weapons isn't necessary, but plus one or plus two is definitely helpful. For the Haze Lab, you'd ideally be at plus three or higher. In the Black Ant Hill Lab, you'd be at plus five. As for mutations, use whatever combat mutations you prefer, but if you have it, Spicy Safety is very effective against the Rusty and Tasty variants, as two of their three attacks are busting damage. This mutation is particularly effective in the Assistant Manager fight. Some general prep is recommended, bandages, smoothies, roasts. I strongly suggest starting to craft meals for their powerful buffs. Might Loaf is particularly inexpensive and offers a powerful buff, reducing your stamina consumption per attack. But Spider Slider and Lervania are really good too to increase crit chance. Just be sure to turn on Kuda Grass Mutation if you have it. As for smoothies, Green Machine or Fuzz on the Rocks are always helpful here. Location. The Rusty and Tasty robots share the same attacks. The Rusty simply does Got less damage. One. The first is a Haymaker. This attack has very little windup. The enemy will raise its right arm upwards while making an odd plunging-like noise and immediately swinging it at the player for light to moderate damage. When you hear the noise or see the arm raised, immediately block to perfect block this one. This attack is so fast though that you'll need to have really good reaction time to block this one properly. The next is a prod smacker attack. The robot starts by pulling its left arm backwards while making some robotic gear noises before thrusting it forward for heavy damage. This also inflicts a lot of stun. This attack is a little easier to prepare for. Wait for it to pull its left arm back, that's the one with the prod smacker on it, and be ready to block a second later. Pay close attention as the tasty variant can delay this attack. Its final move is its three hit combo. This one is its most punishing. It starts by slightly pulling its left arm, the one with the prod smacker, backwards, but this time slashes with it from your right, then your left, then with a slight delay, it charges a final spinning attack that does damage in an AoE all around it. 
Each hit does moderately light damage, but the full combo inflicts very heavy damage that can be lethal in the early game. A good strategy is to simply back up once it makes its first attack, as it's very easy to dodge the second and third. If you choose the perfect block, this is riskier, but very doable, you'll need fast reflexes to block the first attack, but the second and third are much easier. Any perfect block during this combo will cancel the whole combo out. The Arker robots have their own unique movesets favoring ranged electric attacks. They also have more health. Their first attack is an electric shock. The Arker will pull its left arm, that's the one with the gun, inward, and a moment later aims the gun at you, releasing a slow-moving electric orb projectile. Be cautious, it can shoot this attack multiple times in a row. The orbs are very slow moving though, and are generally easy to dodge except in tight confined areas. They deal light to moderate damage, but will bounce off of you continuing to move, which can become very dangerous in tight areas, as you can quickly become overwhelmed with damage. This attack, and surprisingly all of its attacks, can be trivialized with a shield. Simply holding your shield up will allow you to harmlessly bounce the orbs off of it. A perfect block achieves the same thing, but it won't damage your shield or build up the stun meter. You can perfect block by blocking just before the orb hits you. The second is an overload shock. When the player is at close range, the Arker will begin to spastically twitch and whir, then two seconds later releases a powerful electric shock and a wide AoE around it. It inflicts moderate damage and a lot of stun, frequently stunning the player. You can simply back away from this attack, as it has a very long windup, or you can simply hold your shield up negating the attack entirely. Surprisingly, this can actually be perfect blocked. When you hear it begin to twitch and whir, wait two seconds and pull up your shield to perfect block this one. Its final attack is a haymaker. It's the same as the other two robots with nearly the same damage. The tell is slightly different though. It makes a whirring sound instead. As before, this attack is very fast, requiring very quick reflexes to perfect block. This can be a tricky enemy if you're caught unaware. A single robot is generally not a huge threat, but you're often put up against two or more, making these encounters more difficult. A good strategy is to go in aggressively with your attacks, backing up between each swing of your weapon to put space between you in case the enemy attacks. This is generally a pretty safe tactic. With the ranged Arker, you want to be right up in its face as much as possible inflicting damage, but ready to back far away if you see it start twitching frantically. This indicates its overload attack. If you take some damage, put some space between you and the enemy, and be sure to heal up. Once you understand this enemy, they're really not much of a threat. Bombardier beetles are weak to fresh, chopping, and have a weak point on their rump. They resist busting. Bombardiers are easy if you know what you're doing, but a nightmare if you're going in blind. Many of their attacks cannot be blocked and inflict severe damage if you stay within their acid. You can either go with heavy armor like Acorn, or if you have it, Ladybug. Or you could choose to be more nimble with something like Aphid Slippers. Both methods would work. For your weapon, the Peblet Axe, or if you have it, the Insect Axe are a godsend here. Upgrading the Insect Axe is not necessary, but plus one or plus two is very helpful. The typical healing items are helpful here, bandages and smoothies, but if you have it, definitely turn on the mutation Fresh Defense, as this offers significant protection from the acid damage. You can easily unlock this mutation actually by heading to the ice cap container here on the map. You open this with the tier 2 insect hammer, you bust the mints inside. Rank 1 is unlocked by eating just 1 mint, rank 2 by eating 5, and rank 3 by eating 10. The bombardier beetle has 4 attacks. The first is its weakest, a lunging bite. It will only perform this attack at close range. When you get the hang of the bombardier beetle, you'll rarely see this attack as it's best to stay at mid range, waiting for your opportunities to run in and attack. That said, if the Bombardier Beetle does use this attack, it's simple to block. Perfect block by blocking at the moment it lunges forward. The second attack is an Acid Snipe. 
If the player gets too far away from the bombardier, it will launch an acid ball up to a surprisingly long distance to catch the player off guard. It will often back up, then begin shaking, raising its rump in the air before shooting this ball of acid. This attack cannot be blocked, so must be dodged by running to the left or the right. The third move is a forward acid shotgun attack. When the player is at close or mid to close range is when you will see this most often. You can see this coming as the bombardier's head lowers and begins shaking and at the same time raises its rump high into the air. It takes about two seconds, but it will shoot out a very powerful acid blast in front of it. This is another attack that cannot be blocked, so keep a close eye out for its tells so run directly backwards to avoid this attack. The final move is an acid mortar attack. The bombardier starts off by lowering its entire body to the ground, then raising its rump very high into the air before shooting off several acid mortars in random directions around it. Because you never know where the mortars are going to shoot, the best option is to simply back away. Bombardiers are typically in pairs, so it's important to use your trusty bow to pull one at a time. Otherwise, things can get very chaotic quickly. All of its acid attacks are heavily telegraphed and have a long windup, giving you ample time to react if you know what you're looking for. Every single one of its acid attacks cannot be blocked. Simply standing in the acid will inflict severe damage over time that's very easy to miss when your adrenaline is running high. Anytime the bombardier shoots an acid attack, never fight in the acid until the bubbling has completely stopped. Like most tougher enemies, the name of the game is to play defensively. Wait for openings on its first three attacks and then punish before running back out to mid range and waiting for the next attack animation. It's entirely possible to fight the bombardier with just ranged weapons. The same rules apply, but you will need to be careful to keep your distance at all times. The Bombardier Beetle will try to snipe you or run up to you to engage in melee combat frequently if you choose to fight this way. This is a bug where playing with friends is greatly beneficial. Having a tank in the front to keep the Bombardier's aggro while your friend sneaks behind it with an axe to inflict heavy damage on its weak point, its rump. Ladybugs are weak to fresh and busting and have a weak point on their legs but resist, salty, spicy, and stabbing. Ladybugs are slow and tanky, but hit very hard when they do attack. So I suggest some tanky armor like Acorn, or if you have it, Ladybug armor. I also strongly suggest bringing a shield, as failing to perfect block without one will still inflict moderate damage on you. For your weapon, your best option at this time is the Red Ant Club, but if you have it, the Insect Hammer is even better. As a ladybug is very tanky, getting your weapon to plus 2 or plus 3 is recommended. I bring some healing items as well in case you fail to block an attack. The ladybug actually has many attacks, it has 6. The first is a long distance dash. If the player is at long range, the ladybug will telegraph this attack by putting its front two legs together before quickly charging at the player, inflicting moderately heavy damage. This move is easy to perfect block by blocking at the moment the attack is about to hit you. The second and third are a headbutt. Both are slightly different looking. The ladybug will rear up on its hind legs and quickly smash its head into the character for heavy damage. The other version of this attack, the ladybug will lower its head, spreading its middle legs out wide before headbutting you. These attacks are deceptively fast, which makes blocking tricky. To perfect block, block right before the lunge forward, about a half a second after it starts the attack animation. The fourth attack is a battle cry. The ladybug will begin to shake before raising its head and shouting a loud roar. This move will slightly heal it. The fifth is a side ram. Depending on if you're on its left or right side, the ladybug will twist its body in the opposite direction before ramming at you with its full weight for severe damage. Once the ladybug has turned its body, be ready to block at that very moment to perfect block this one. The final move you will only see if you decide to jump on top of the ladybug. It's a buck attack. The ladybug will shake before wildly bucking the player off of it. 
This unblockable attack hits extremely hard and can one hit kill you, so it's best to completely avoid this tactic. The Ladybug is a simple fight that can go south quickly. Because the Ladybug is less aggressive and attacks less frequently than most bugs, it's easy to overextend an attack more than you should, which leaves you open for severe damage. Clubs and hammers are slow, so you should only be attacking two or three times max before going back on the defensive. Keep in mind, when attacking, do your best to swing your weapons at its legs for additional damage. And always keep your heals on the ready in case you miss a block. Typically, I don't encourage cheesing. I prefer to fight bugs straightforward, but this is actually a very easy bug to cheese with ranged weapons. You can stand on top of something tall and immovable, like a root or a landmark, and rain arrows down on it. The enemy's AI may choose to flee if it can't get to you, so be ready to chase in case this happens. This fight can be a lot easier with a team. Place players on the opposite side of the ladybug so that one player can almost always be doing damage as a ladybug can only attack in one direction. If you're far enough into the game, the mint mallet or any other fresh infused busting weapon will make short work of them. Stink bugs are weak to fresh and stabbing and are immune to gas. What makes the stink bug so hard is their gas. You will either need a gas mask or the toxicology badge accessory found in the pond, although this has been nerfed. Although it can be difficult to make at this point, I'd be remiss to not mention that Gastro Goo Smoothie can protect you from gas as well. Once the gas threat is eliminated, the stink bug is actually pretty weak, so tanky armor isn't absolutely necessary. If you choose to go melee, I would still wear something like acorn, ladybug, or grub armor. If you go ranged, Try the bee armor if you have it. For your weapon, many options are viable, but the red ant club or bone trident are good options at plus two or plus three. For range, I wouldn't try this without either the tier two insect bow or even better, the crow crossbow, again upgraded to plus two or plus three. Stink bugs have three attacks. The first is a belly flop gas attack. The stink bug will dip its head while raising its abdomen up on its hind legs before leaping at the player belly flopping and releasing its gas in a wide circumference. It's best to back up and block right before the attack hits to perfect block this one. Sometimes this attack will miss entirely, and as long as you have the gas mask or the toxicology badge on, you will take no damage from the gas. The second attack is a gas release. The stink bug will make a buzzing noise and lower its entire body towards the ground, slightly shaking before releasing a massive cloud of gas in the surrounding area. As before, as long as you have the mask or the badge, this attack is harmless and should be punished heavily. The final attack is a bite. The stink bug will start by buzzing heavily then shaking its head before biting at the player. This attack hits for moderate damage and can be perfect blocked by blocking right before the attack connects to the player. The stink bug's greatest threat is its gas. Yeah, it's gassy. Once this threat is eliminated, this fight becomes much easier. There are a couple things to watch out for though. Stink bugs tend to be in packs, so be sure to pull only one at a time. Your gas mask will take durability damage throughout the fight, so you need to be cautious to end fights quickly and repair between battles. The stink bug is quite weak to bow damage. A level three crow crossbow with standard arrows can kill a stink bug in as few as eight shots. As a stink bug is quite slow, you can easily kite it while bursting it down with arrows. Aphid slippers can make this even easier. If you're far enough into the game, the mint mallet or any fresh infused spear or mint arrows are extremely effective here. Mosquitoes are pretty tough and give a lot of players a hard time. They're weak to fresh, chopping, and slashing, but resist busting. Mosquitoes are agile and hit very hard, so unless you're confident in your skills, I wouldn't attempt this enemy until you have ladybug armor, preferably at plus two or higher, and a good shield. For a weapon, you can't go wrong with an insect axe or a black ant sword. However, the bone trident is also effective, also ideally at plus two or higher. Daggers aren't the best choice here as their range is lacking. 
If you have it, definitely turn on the mutation Spicy Safety, as this will reduce stabbing damage, which is the damage type of all the mosquitoes' attacks. Mosquitoes tend to come in small swarms, making it challenging to endure their onslaught. So additional prep is recommended. Bring plenty of heals, and if possible, a shield, unless you're confident. If you're hunting mosquitoes for their blood sacs to make heal bosses, be sure to throw down a lean-to in case you die. Mosquitoes have three attacks. The first is a heavy stab. The mosquito will buzz while leaning backwards with its nose pointing straight at you, before thrusting aggressively for moderately heavy damage. Like all its attacks, any damage it inflicts can heal the mosquito. This attack can be perfect blocked by blocking just as the mosquito thrusts forward at the player. The second is a loop-to-loop -loop thrust. It will start by buzzing, then perform a loop in the air before charging at the player for significant damage. This move is well telegraphed and can easily be blocked by blocking just before the attack hits you. The third attack is its most devastating, a three hit combo. This move is not well telegraphed and hits extremely hard. The mosquito will come into close range and begin to sway side to side before launching a quick three hit stab from side to side. To perfect block, watch for the mosquito to sway side to side and be quick to block the instant it attacks. Perfect blocking any attack in this combo will cancel the rest of the combo out. Many factors make this fight challenging. Mosquitoes are agile and will frequently fly out of range of your melee attacks. When they do come close, they're always coming in for an attack and leave only a small opening once they're finished. They also tend to spawn near other mosquitoes or other threats like bombardier beetles. You need to find a good balance between defense and aggressive offense. Always be ready to block, but then ready to immediately counterattack aggressively. And don't forget to heal. You may think range combat would be the easier option here, but that's unfortunately not the case. Mosquitoes are very fast and can catch up to you quite easily unless you are running some very agile gear and mutations. Because of their aggression, when they do attack, you will be unable to block with your bow, leaving you completely open to severe damage, which will heal the mosquito. If you have friends, a good strategy is to have someone take the hits with heavy armor and a shield, while your friend comes in from the side or behind to inflict heavy damage while the mosquito is stuck in its attack animations. If you're far enough into the game, the Coltana or any fresh infused sword, axe, or arrows is going to be extremely effective here. These are a moderately tanky bug that are weak to fresh chopping or slashing and have a weak point on their eyes, but resist busting. A single bee is generally not a huge threat. Unfortunately, they do tend to be in hordes. There are two options here, melee or ranged. For melee, medium armor like spider or heavy armor like ladybug at plus two or higher is ideal. For your weapon, a bone spear is actually quite useful for its range, but an insect axe or black ant sword at plus two or higher are probably a little bit better. For ranged, a sleek upgraded marksman hat, or if you have it, bee armor with aphid slippers at plus three or higher is great here. Help yourself out even further by turning on the mutation buff lungs for increased stamina. Spicy safety will also reduce all the damage from its sting attacks. You should have an insect bow or crow crossbow upgraded to plus three or higher for this. Kiting the bees with ranged is a great option when you're fast. I'd recommend some extra prep for this bug. You're likely to fight many bees, so it's best to set up a lean-to in case you die. Be sure to bring some meal buffs such as Larvania or Spider Slider for the increased crit chance. A good smoothie would be fuzz on the rocks or human food. Human food gets very easy to farm once you're on the picnic table where the bees live. The bees have three attacks. The first is a charge sting attack. The bee will emit a high-pitched buzz while slightly rising in the air before charging at you stinger first at relatively low speed. In fact, the speed of this attack is annoyingly slow to the point that it can trip you up on perfect blocking. Just be patient and wait to block right before it hits you. 
The second attack is a three hit combo that can hit pretty hard if they all connect. The bee will buzz slightly, curling itself inward before aggressively attacking you with three quick jabs. I don't know about you guys, but this attack gives me trouble. The timing for a perfect block is tricky on this one. When you hear the buzzing, get ready to block immediately. If you miss, don't panic, begin flicking block quickly. Any perfect block during this combo will cancel the combo out. The third attack is something new in the form of crowd control, Pollen Dust Cloud. The bee will typically start by rising in the air slightly and begin shaking back and forth while buzzing. Shortly after, it will emit a pollen cloud in a wide circumference around it. The pollen will apply a slow debuff to your character for a short while. This attack can do damage, but it's rare. You would need to be at point blank range. As this attack is unblockable, the best thing to do is to run directly backwards until you're out of its range. Be sure to keep out of the pollen cloud as it will remain on the field for a while longer and can still apply the debuff. As with most bugs that come in packs, be sure to pull one bee at a time with your bow as much as possible. I personally prefer using the range strategy on these bugs, but melee is completely viable. If you find that you're not doing well in melee, try again using a shield. When attacking, try your best to focus on hitting their eyes for extra damage. If you're far enough into the game, the mint mace or a fresh infused spear, axe, or arrows will do very well here. Black soldier ants are weak to spicy and stabbing, but resist chopping and slashing, and unlike the red soldier ants, also resist fresh. I won't spend too much time on the black soldier ants as they share the same moveset as the red soldier ants. You can just jump back to that bug for more details. What I will say is that the black soldier ants are much tankier and deal additional damage. Because their damage output can be surprisingly high if you make too many mistakes, bringing a black ant shield is a very good idea here. If you have it, the cool Tana will make short work of these bugs. A spicy infused spear or arrows are also very effective. So you've made it to the wolf spider. Congratulations. This is a major milestone that's going to test your skills in preparation. Now I've been monitoring the pool I set up and thanks to you guys, I can see that this is an enemy that gives you a lot of trouble. So I'm going to take a little extra time and really dive deep into this enemy to give you some help to take them down. Wolf spiders are weak to spicy, chopping, and slashing, but resist fresh and stabbing. If you're going to do this legit and not cheese it, you will most certainly need some preparation unless you're extremely confident in your skills or you're overgeared. The wolf spider can inflict moderate to severe damage on all of its attacks. Additionally, any of its attacks have a high chance of inflicting poison, which will rapidly deplete your health in large chunks every couple seconds. So let's dig into how to kill these guys. I strongly recommend the tankiest armor you have available, ideally ladybug armor that has been upgraded to plus three or better. A black ant shield is also highly recommended, but not necessary. For your weapon, some good options include black ant swords or the insect axe at plus two or better, and if possible, a spicy infusion will help you considerably. If you have it, the Kultana or Spicy Staff is a godsend here. It's by far one of the best options in the game for dealing with spiders. Now, for preparation, I hope you've been practicing everything I've been teaching you. For meals, I highly recommend Omelette for its thorn ability. This will reflect back a small amount of damage on the attacker, which is very helpful here because the wolf spider is relentless in its attacks. Another good meal choice is Lavarnia or Spider Slider, for its increased critical hit chance. Be sure to put the mutation Coup de Grasse and Trapper Keeper on if you use either of those two meals, or even better chance to crit and more crit damage. For smoothies, I hope you finish the Pond Lab, because the Muscle Sprouts are going to be very helpful here. Muscle Sprouts double the healing effect of a smoothie, which is important because the Wolf Spider can put out some serious damage quickly. The best smoothies for the job are probably human food for damage resist or fuzz on the rocks for additional max health. Don't forget to bring a band-aid or two as well as you're definitely going to be popping one at the beginning of this fight. As for mutations, if you haven't bought it yet, you should buy meat shield and buff lungs. Parry Master is very good as is Coup de Grasse. Cardio Fan is always helpful. 
And if you have it, definitely activate Mithridatism. If you haven't been doing so, you need to start collecting milk molars and upgrade the number of mutations you can have at one time. You can have up to five. The wolf spider has four attacks. The first is a high jump. The wolf spider will lower its body down before leaping high into the air at the player, inflicting massive damage. This attack can hit you even at very far range. Thankfully, this attack is well telegraphed, giving you ample time to perfect block. Block just as the spider has leapt into the air, and you will take no damage at all and avoid being poisoned. The second is a charged bite. The wolf spider will push itself up, hissing at you menacingly, before leaning back and then lunging forward with a severely damaging bite. Again, this is another well-telegraphed attack that is easy to perfect block. As the wolf spider begins to lean back after its hiss, get ready to block almost immediately. The third attack is a bite that comes from the side. Depending on your position, the wolf spider will lean sharply to its left or its right before lunging at you with a bite. This attack is a bit faster and harder to react to, but just look for that tell where it pulls to the side and get ready to block right away to execute the perfect block. The fourth and final attack is its most devastating, a five hit combo, which has very little wind up, making it tricky to react in time. The wolf spider starts by putting all eight legs on the ground and immediately raises its front legs on your left, quickly coming in for a bite from your right, then your left, then right, then left again, and finally pulls backwards, charging up a strong bite with a slight delay. This might sound overwhelming, but it's really not that bad. If you've been practicing on the Orb Weavers, it's very similar. The Wolf Spider simply adds two additional hits into the combo. Block the first four hits with perfect rhythm. That fourth hit is slightly faster though. That final attack is much more delayed and you will definitely need to block this one as it hits the hardest. This is one of those attacks where perfect blocking will not end the combo, so keep on your feet. Now the following strategies are written as if you are fighting one of your first wolf spiders without the Mithridatism mutation. Once you unlock Mithridatism, things get substantially easier. Your first wolf is always the hardest. Okay, so if you're going into this fight solo, there are two main strategies. The first is to go in with the intention of perfect blocking all the hits. The strategy requires a cool head and intentional aggression. Pay close attention to every attack, perfect blocking at the right moment, and then punishing with a few attacks before going back on the defensive. If you can manage to perfect block every attack, you never have to worry about being poisoned, which is the big threat here. Should you be poisoned or an attack gets through your guard, wait to heal until the wolf spider has finished its attack animation. The safest option is to focus on healing and attack only when your health is high. The second strategy, if perfect blocking is not your thing, you're going to need a shield. Blocking the attacks will stop the damage, however poison can still get through a shield unless you perfect block. Because of this, you're going to have to fight defensively. If you get poisoned, you're going to have to keep a close eye on your health and heal anytime you're close to half health or lower, and then attack after the Wolf Spider's next combo. Never try to heal an attack in the same opening. If you have friends, this is a great bug to team up on. One or two of you can focus on tanking. The tanks focus on healing and trying to keep the wolf spider's aggression by attacking it whenever its attention shifts, while the other player attack at the end of each of the wolf spider's attack animations. Keep practicing, guys. I know this one might seem tough, but it's a true badge of honor once you get things down pat. Your first wolf spider is the hardest. Once you get Mithridatism, things get substantially easier, and before you know it, you're going to be a wolf spider champion. I've kept most of the infected bugs separate because each of them are a little weird and don't neatly fit into the tier system in my opinion. The first of the infected is the infected weevil, who is weak to slashing and resists busting, chopping, stabbing, and is immune to gas. For armor, I wouldn't use anything less than grub, acorn, spider, but ladybug, or better, is preferable. This is to help you survive the weevil's explosion in case you mess up. The infected weevil only has one attack, Kamikaze Fungal Explosion. As soon as the weevil notices the player, it will begin to quickly run to you. 
once close, it'll begin to make some of its signature wheezing and snort noises before bursting in a violent fungal explosion. This causes severe damage if at point blank range, but the damage falls off sharply the further the player is from the center of the explosion. This is a bug better avoided than fought. The easiest strategy to deal with them is to get their aggro and wait for them to approach, letting them start their explosion animation, at which point you dash off madly from the weevil. If you are set on killing the infected weevil yourself, you're going to need a very good bow with feather or splinter arrows to take it down before it would normally blow up. Alternatively, a heavily upgraded tier two or tier three sword can work as well. Infected gnats have no weaknesses or resistances, but are immune to gas. By themselves, infected gnats are harmless as they deal no damage to the player. However, they do have an attack of sorts, a disarming bop. The infected gnat will follow the player and like normal gnats will attempt to bop you. When they do so, whatever weapon you're carrying in your hand will fall to the ground. This can be very dangerous if you're already in combat with another creature and as such, the infected gnat should be prioritized. As best as possible, always be keeping an eye on your horizon when traveling through the haze for infected gnats. If you see one, pull out your trusty bow and snipe it down long before you get close to it. Attempting to run up to the gnat and hitting it with your melee weapon will almost always result in you being disarmed. If this happens, don't panic. Use your fist to quickly take it down and then pick up your weapon. Infected mites are weak to fresh, slashing, and chopping, but resist busting, stabbing, explosive, and are completely immune to gas. Thanks to data miners, we also know they resist generic damage from weapons like the ant clubs and the mint mace. That's a lot of resistances. Because of this, a tanky armor like acorn, grub, spider, or ladybug is strongly recommended. As for your weapons, a lot of things can get the job done, but a black ant sword, spider dagger, are a great choice here. Despite its resistance to stabbing, a bow is actually a good choice here as well, preferably an insect or crow crossbow upgraded to plus two or higher. They prefer to fight you from range, but they do have two attacks. One, a short range, and the other, a long range. The long range attack is a fungal shot. They will rear upward before quickly shooting fungus at you, inflicting light to moderate damage that is unblockable. It can repeat this attack every three to five seconds. The best strategy here is to simply dodge, or even better, place yourself between an object like dried grass. The second attack you will only encounter at close range, a jumping attack. This attack inflicts light to moderate damage as well, but is easily perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the mite is in the air. A single infected mite is not really a big threat. The real problem is you will encounter them in groups. The best thing to do is to try to spot them before they spot you, although this is hard if the haste is currently active. Do your best to try to aggro only one at a time and snipe it from a distance. Put yourself behind a dried grass to block its projectiles and then peek out with shots as you're able. If you decide to go melee, it's going to be a little harder as you will almost definitely aggro multiple infected mites. Stay on your toes, don't stop moving, grave side to side or circle the enemy whenever possible. Fight aggressively to take them down as quickly as possible because blocking is not very effective here. Infected larvae are a step up in difficulty from the other infected bugs. They're weak to fresh and slashing, but resist salty, spicy, busting, chopping, explosive, stabbing, and are immune to gas. Also, thanks to data miners, we know they resist generic damage from weapons like clubs. Again, that's a lot of resistances. Infected larvae are extremely aggressive, agile, hit hard, and are often found in groups. So tanky armor is strongly recommended, preferably spider or ladybug at plus two or higher. Because of their agility, fast slashing weapons like the black ant sword, spider dagger, or bone dagger at plus one or higher is best. Fresh infusion can help a lot here. You need to be very careful not to overcommit with your attacks, otherwise you'll quickly be overwhelmed with damage. Some basic healing items can be helpful here, but a lot of prep isn't needed unless you're planning to clear a bunch of trenches at once. 
The infected larva has three attacks. But before I go into them, I want to warn, they can be very tricky as they can combine attacks or cancel their attacks, starting up a different one at any point in their combos. The first attack is a side swipe. The infected larva will shift to the side before biting at the player aggressively for moderate damage. Just like regular larva, this can be perfect blocked at the moment the attack is about to launch. If you're at mid-range, the larva can use this attack as well to break the gap between you. If this is the case, delay your block until the enemy is about to connect with you. The second is a 3-hit combo. This is the same 3-hit combo as the regular larva. It will rear back to its side before swiping at you from your right, then the left, then finally from straight back. The first two hits are in perfect rhythm, and the final is ever slightly delayed. Perfect block by blocking just as this attack is released. Perfect blocking any attack in this combo will cancel it out, same as the larva. Its final attack is a double fungal explosion. The infected larva will telegraph this by puffing itself up and then exploding twice in a row with a slight delay between each explosion. This attack is unblockable and can inflict severe or instantly lethal damage if not avoided. Watch carefully for its tell and back away. You really need to keep on your toes with this enemy, paying close attention to what it's doing. Like normal, try to aggro just one at a time with your trusty bow. Unlike your normal enemy, this one doesn't leave a lot of safe windows to inflict damage. Your best chance for safe damage is to wait for it to use its double fungal explosion before running in and punishing hard. All of its other attacks, you run the risk of it cancelling out its combo or combining attacks at any point. If you're using a fast weapon like the sword I recommended, you can generally still get in at least one or two hits without taking too much damage. Infected ladybugs are tough. They're weak to fresh and busting, but resist salty, spicy, chopping, explosive, slashing, and stabbing, and are completely immune to gas. They're very tanky and have high damage output, making this a tough fight. Range combat is very effective against this enemy, despite its resistance to arrows. If you go this route, you want to be fast and nimble, so something like B armor that's been upgraded to plus 3 or higher is a good choice. You'll want an insect bow or the crow crossbow at plus three or higher, and if you're able to make them, fresh arrows will help a lot. If you decide to go melee, the mint mace is an excellent choice, but an insect hammer or red ant club will get the job done. If using the mint mace, no upgrade is needed, though helpful, but the insect hammer or red ant club should be plus three or higher to end this fight faster. For this bug, I highly recommend some preparation, for your meal, larvania or spider slider for the increased crit chance. For smoothies, human food for extra defense, preferably using muscle sprouts for extra healing effect, and roast and bandages if possible. Some good mutations include meat shield, buff lungs, cuda grass, and trapper peeper. The infected ladybug has four attacks. The first three are the same as the regular ladybug. The first is its standard headbutt. The ladybug will rear up on its hind legs and quickly smash its head into the character for heavy damage. These attacks are deceptively fast, which makes blocking tricky. The perfect block, block right before the lunge forward, about a half a second after it starts the animation. The second is a side ram. Depending on if you're on its left or its right, the ladybug will twist its body in the opposite direction before ramming at you with its full weight for severe damage. Once the ladybug has turned its body, be ready to block at that very moment to perfect block this one. The third move you'll only see if you decide to jump on top of the ladybug, it's a buck attack. The ladybug will shake before wildly bucking the player off of it. This unblockable attack hits extremely hard and can one-hit kill you, so it's best to avoid this tactic completely. The final attack is new, it's a Fungal Scatterbot. The Ladybug starts by centering its stance and then quickly thrashing about releasing multiple fungal bombs in random directions. This attack is unblockable and inflicts severe or often lethal damage, therefore it's best to run far out of range until you're sure that every bomb has exploded. The range option is by far the safer choice here. 
The infected ladybug has abandoned its charge attack, meaning it's going to have a hard time keeping up with you. Hold it constantly with arrows while cutting it backwards. Just be careful where you're backing up to. If you go full melee, you need to be very careful. Fight very defensively, attacking after the ladybug has finished its own attacks. If you're not good with perfect blocks, a shield is highly recommended. Make sure to heal whenever your health dips below half, as the ladybug can easily kill you. Congratulations, you've made it to tier 3! From here on out, the bugs get more complex and challenging, but the drops are well worth it for making some of the best gear in the game. Scarabs are important for upgrading weapons, but are oh so aggravating, so I've decided to cover them in this guide. For those unfamiliar with them, scarabs drop twinkling shells, which are required to upgrade weapons to rank 8 and 9. They're weak to all elements, fresh, salty, sour, spicy, and have no resistances, which is all good and fine, but they're still hard to kill. They have no attacks at all, but will flee at rapid speed as soon as they see the player or take damage. Shortly after running away, they will burrow, disappearing. They will later reappear in the nearby area once it's safe. They are so fast it's almost impossible to catch up to them, even with aphid slippers. Unless you're very lucky, scarab hunting requires some preparation and patience. Reddit user Etranor made this map to help players find scarab spawning grounds. Once you have killed one, this gets a lot easier as you can scan for twinkling shells at any field station. For gear, a black ox crossbow at plus six or higher with splinter arrows is enough to one hit kill the scarab. You can also manage this at plus three as long as you have a sleek marksman cap on. One hit killing the scarab is so important because you'll rarely get the chance to get in a second attack. Now the best option is to simply be patient until you unlock the Undershed Lab. You see, you can make your way on the right side of the Undershed, following the electrical wiring to this pipe where there's a quarter sticking out. Just follow along here as I show you. Inside, you'll find four scarabs, which are incapable of burrowing away from you. They can run, but they can't hide. <laughs> Ladybug larvae are extremely aggressive and agile fighters. They're basically a larva on steroids, or swole on milk molars, whatever. <laughs> They're weak to fresh and stabbing, but resist spicy, busting, chopping, and slashing. Both ranged and melee are viable options. If you're gonna go ranged, a crow crossbow or ox crossbow at plus five or higher is recommended. If possible, splinter or mint arrows will make this a lot easier. The armor for ranged isn't too important, just keep on your toes and don't let yourself get backed into a corner. For melee, a tier 2 or tier 3 spear paired with a shield is going to be your best option. Fresh infusion will make this much easier, but it's not necessary. A mint staff is also really good if you're great at perfect blocking. Because you're going to be in the thick of the fight, you definitely want some tanky armor for this one. Antlion or ladybug at plus 5 or higher are good choices. Antlion is the best because ladybug larvae can apply sizzle buildup on their attacks, which can lead to your health draining faster than it normally would. The normal combat mutations are useful here, Meat Shield, Buff Lungs, Coup de Grass, Cardio Fan, and Parry Master, but if you have it, be sure to turn on Fresh Defense for its sizzle protection, as the Ladybug Larva do apply sizzle to each of its attacks. Definitely start the fight off by popping a bandage, and be ready to use smoothies or roasts to heal as needed. A good smoothie choice would be human food, if you're taking on a nest of ladybird larvae, prepare the meal Quesadilla Antlion, which adds sizzle protection and thorns, turning their aggression against them. And be sure to use muscle sprouts for better healing on those smoothies. 
Ladybug larvae have nearly the same moveset as their regular larvae. However, they are much trickier to read as they have faster windup animations and can cancel combos mid-attack to throw you off. The first attack is a long distance lunge attack. They will back up, then rear back and lunge at the player for a deceivingly long distance. This can be perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the larva lunges forward. If you're at further range, wait to block until the attack is close to hitting you. The second is a side swipe attack. This is a one hit attack where the larva pivots backwards and slightly to the side then lunges at the player. This too can be perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the larva lunges. The third is a three hit combo. The larva pivots strongly to the side and lunges at the player, but this time executing a three hit combo attacking side to side then from straight back. The first two hits are performed with the same timing, but the final hit has a slight delay. The timing for the perfect block is the same as the other attacks, block just as the attack is coming at you. If you perfect block any hit during this combo, the combo will be cancelled out due to the knockback. Something to keep in mind, occasionally the larva will change things up and cancel the final attack, making it a two hit combo. There is a new move as well, a back step where they will hop backwards twice to create space from you to avoid taking damage. You can either chase or take this moment to heal. Ranged is a safer option here. Kite the ladybird larva backwards while you pelt it with arrows. If you do get backed into a corner or overwhelmed, be sure to flee as your light armor cannot stand up to their damage output. For melee, I hope you brought that shield because this fight can go south quickly. Fight defensively and be ready to block on a dime. Getting hit with a couple quick combos is often all that needs to happen for you to die unless you're heavily overgeared. Antlions come in two forms. The first I'll call a pit antlion, and the second is just your standard antlion. The pit antlion is formidable and sometimes more difficult than even the wolf spider. The standard antlion is still very strong, but a little more bark than bite. They are weak to salty and slashing, but resist fresh, spicy, chopping, and thanks to data miners we know they also resist generic damage from weapons like clubs. Because you encounter these in the sandbox, the best armor for the job is going to be antlion, preferably at plus 3 or higher. But if fighting at night, ladybug or roly-poly armor is a good option. A very good weapon choice for this is a black ant shield combined with a black ant sword or rusty spear. If you can, salt infusion is very powerful here. If you're confident in your skills, you don't need to upgrade the sword, but plus three or higher is definitely going to help you take it down faster. Some preparation is very helpful. Be sure to set up a lean-to nearby, like at the Oasis, as it is easy to slip up and die until you get used to their attacks. Bandages for the beginning and post-fight, roast or human food smoothie is very good, and if possible, be sure to use muscle sprouts to double the healing, as these guys can hit very hard if you fail to block correctly. If facing the pit antlion, a meal can go a long way. Try Larvarnia, Spider Slider, Mite Loaf, or if you have it, Quesadilla Antlion. The normal combat mutations are useful, Meat Shield, Buff Lungs, Coup de Grasse, Cardio Fan, and Parry Master, but if you have it, be sure to turn on Fresh Defense, preferably Rank 3, to reduce buildup of Sizzle during the daytime. Spicy Safety is also extremely helpful, as it will reduce the damage from a couple of the Antlion's attacks. You can easily get the first rank of spicy safety by eating a piece of hot cha-cha candy and rank two by eating a total of four. There are a bunch of this candy in the sandbox. The pit antlion and regular antlion have some different move sets, so I'll cover them separately. The regular antlion, its first move is a burrowing attack. It will lower itself down into the ground before attacking you from below about two seconds later for heavy damage. Don't bother running away as the antlion will emerge below you for almost any distance. In all my attempts, I was only able to perfect block this attack a few times. The timing is very tricky. The best strategy is to wait for it to go underground 
and be ready to block just under two seconds later. If you're feeling bold, you can actually attack the antlion even when it's underground by attacking the sand in the area it dug down in. The second attack is a heavy vice grip. The antlion will lower itself down, spreading its jaw as wide as it can before lunging at the player after a short delay. This can hit you even at mid distance. You need to be very careful with this attack as the antlion will occasionally execute it faster than normal. Perfect block by blocking at the very moment it begins to lunge forward. Its final attack is a side swipe. It will telegraph this by hissing with its jaw pointed upward, swinging them from your left before biting at you from that side for moderate damage. Perfect block by blocking as soon as the attack begins to swing at you from the left side. Now for the pit antlion's moveset, the first is a brutal ant toss. The antlion will only perform this at long to mid distance. It will reach its head just below the sand grabbing the corpse of an ant before flinging at you for severe or often lethal damage. Its attack is very accurate and can hit you at surprisingly far range, so always be on your toes. This attack is blockable, although it's often best to dodge by running to the side as the attack is well telegraphed. If you choose to block, perfect block just at the moment before the ant would hit you. Its next attack is a rock slide. When you're at mid or close range, the ant line will telegraph this attack by crying out loudly with its jaws pointed upward before digging its head underground and spraying you with sand. This attack does little damage, but will pull you closer to the antlion and stagger you. You can actually perfect block this attack. To do so, block just as the antlion juts out from the ground. Doing so will not only block the attack, but cancel out the pull and stagger. As an added bonus, if you run up to the antlion at point blank range and perfect block this attack, you will actually stagger the antlion as well. The third attack is a heavy vice grip. This is the same as a standard antlion. Follow the same instructions from there. The fourth is a side swipe. Again, the same as the standard ant lion, so you can just follow those instructions. Its final attack is very devastating, a three hit combo. It starts by raising its head and jaws upward to the left, quietly hissing, and after a short delay, thrashing side to side for severe and often lethal damage. This attack hits so hard that it will almost always break through your shield's guard. As such, this attack is best avoided. When you see this attack being telegraphed, back up to dodge the attack entirely. If you react too slowly or feel confident in your blocking skills, make sure to perfect block the initial hit by blocking just as it releases the first attack from the left. Otherwise, you're going to take a very hard hit. Fighting an antlion requires cool-headed aggression. They are slow, leaving large windows between their attacks to punish. Be aggressive, attacking as much as possible, but always watching out for its tells ready to block. Failure to react properly to its attacks will leave you with very little health, in which case you need to immediately prioritize healing before resuming combat. Don't worry, you guys got this. With a little practice, antlions go down pretty easy. Just remember, the pit ant lines are harder than the ones on land. Dust mites are not the huge threat like they were back in early access. However, they can still be plenty annoying in large groups, easily overwhelming you if you're not cautious. They are 50% weak to fresh and 25% weak to stabbing, but resist salty, spicy, busting, and thanks to data miners we know they resist generic as well. Some general prep can be helpful, bandages, smoothies, and roast. No particular armor is required to face the dust mites, but tankier armor is helpful, something like black ant, antlion, ladybug, or roly poly, any similar choice upgraded to plus five or better. I particularly like black ant armor, as wearing the full set will reflect part of the attacker's damage back on them. For weapons, a tier two or tier three spear at plus five or higher, something like the bone trident or rusty spear is a good choice here. Fresh infusion will help make short work of them. Bows are also extremely effective, ideally a heavily upgraded crow crossbow or black ox crossbow. If you can spare them, mint arrows are also very deadly. 
Despite their resistance to generic damage, the Mint Mace is still effective, as their generic resistance is only 25%, yet it's 50% weak to fresh, still netting you positive damage. Dust might share the same basic attacks of the infected mites. The first is a dust shot. They will rear upward before quickly shooting dust at you, inflicting light to moderate damage that is unblockable. It can repeat this attack every 3 to 5 seconds. This attack applies a very short debuff that slows the player, reduces their stamina regen, and reduces their damage. The best strategy here is to simply dodge strafing left or right. If possible, place yourself behind objects, although that's often difficult as the dust mites are strategically placed in areas without cover. The second, you will only encounter at close range, a jumping attack. This attack inflicts light to moderate damage as well, but is easily perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the mite is in the air. A single dust mite is not much of a threat, however they're almost always in groups making this more difficult. Unless you're lightly armored, a few hits from the dust shot is not really going to inflict much damage, but when surrounded by many dust mites, this damage starts to stack up pretty quickly. And because you're being hit by so many projectiles, the durability of your armor is being quickly whittled away. My preferred strategy is to go in with a bow. I'll place myself strategically sniping down the dust mites, trying to only get aggro one at a time. Ideally, you placed yourself somewhere that you can hide behind between your shots. Otherwise, be sure to strafe left to right or jump continuously to avoid as much damage as possible. Melee is still fine here, but you need to be aggressive and never stop moving. Always be strafing or circling around the enemy, trying to take them out as quickly as possible while dodging the dust shots. Termite workers have a 50% weakness to salty and a 25% weakness to stabbing. They resist spicy and slashing by 50%, and thanks to data miners, we know they also resist generic damage by 25%. They're also completely immune to dust. I don't know about you guys, but the termite workers are more terrifying to me than the soldiers. I'd rather take on soldiers all day than a horde of workers. It's that acid shot. Man, does that attack hit hard. We'll talk more about that when we do a breakdown on the attacks. Because termites live in a colony, you'll inevitably be fighting a large quantity of them when you choose to assault their den so a lot of prep is recommended. For armor, I highly recommend medium or heavy to get this job done, as you're going to be taking a lot of attacks. The best ones you'll probably have at this time are going to be Ladybug, Black Ant, or Antlion. Though, if you have it, Roly Poly is even better. For weapons, nothing's better than a good spear or a crossbow for ranged players, all at plus six or better. If you've been holding off and infusing your weapons with elements, I suggest you start doing it now. A rusty spear with salt infusion will be your go-to weapon for taking on the termite den for the rest of the game. One player is going to need to hold a torch as the den is very dark in most places. If you're not the player holding a torch, combine your spear with a black ant shield, or if you have it, a fire ant shield. This is going to be a great setup for this fight. For the rest of your prep, set up a lean-to nearby. Prepare many roasts or beefy smoothies. Liquid Rage, Human Food, or Fuzz on the Rocks are good choices. For mutations, some of the best will be Javelinier to reduce their defense if you're using a spear, or Sharpshooter to root the enemy in place if using a bow. Parrymaster, Cardiofan, Coup de Grasse, Trapper Keeper are good, but definitely turn on fresh defense to reduce the acid damage. I also recommend bringing a few shinobi sneezes. If things get too chaotic or overwhelming, throw one down and disengage to regroup and heal up. The termite workers have one unique attack, but the other two are the same as the red or black worker ants. The first is a charged lunge. The termite will lean back, charging up an attack that releases about two seconds later, lunging forward at the player for moderate damage. While this attack is easily telegraphed, 
because of the long delay, getting the timing down for the perfect block is a little tricky. The best thing to do when you see it leaning back is to be patient. Count to two seconds and immediately block. The second is a side swipe. The termite will lean either to its right or its left before immediately swiping at you for moderate damage. This attack is tricky as there's very little warning to get ready for it. Pay very close attention to what the termite worker is doing. And if you see it lean to its side, immediately block to perfect block this one. The final attack is an acid shot. The termite will stand in place and begin repeatedly heaving and churning before launching an acid shot about two and a half seconds later. This attack hits for heavy damage and applies a short debuff reducing your defense. Unlike the bombardier beetle, you don't need to worry about the acid pool inflicting damage over time, so feel free to fight in it. As this attack is unblockable, the best strategy is to strafe side to side or run straight at the termite worker. When fighting termite workers, the biggest threat is their acid shot and their group fighting mentality. A single worker is not a huge threat with the right gear, but in most situations you're going to be fighting two or more at the same time. In this situation, the best thing to do is to be aggressive trying to take a single worker out at a time rather than shielding up and going on the defensive. The one thing you will have to watch out for, however, is its acid shot. So when you see them starting to heave and churn, get ready to strafe to avoid it. In this fight, you are sure to take a fair amount of damage, so be sure to bring plenty of roasts, smoothies, and bandages. It's inevitable that termite soldiers are going to be mixed in the group with termite workers at some point while you're fighting. As much as possible, your priority should always be to take out the workers first, as they have less health and can snipe you from afar, inflicting significant damage if they group up. Termite soldiers are the angrier, bigger brother of the workers. They share the same weaknesses and resistances as the worker. They're 50% weak to salty, 25% weak to stabbing, but are 50% resistant to spicy and slashing, as well as 25% resistant to generic damage. They're also completely immune to dust. Now you're going to be fighting workers and soldiers at the same time. So I recommend the exact same prep as I made for the termite workers. Refer back to that last chapter where I talk about that gear and setup. Termite soldiers do not have the acid shot of the workers, however they have 5 attacks of their own. The first is a side swipe, the same as the worker. The soldier will lean to its side before quickly lunging forward for a moderately damaging bite. This attack has little wind up, so when you see it lean to the side, get ready to block right away to execute the perfect block. These next three attacks look very similar and can be very difficult to distinguish from each other. Luckily, the timing is almost the same. The first of these three is its charged bite. The soldier will rear back with pinchers wide while hissing at you menacingly before lunging forward for a heavy attack. To execute the perfect block, wait until the soldier has leaned back and be ready to block a second later as it lunges forward. The next is a stunning bite, very similar to the charged bite, however the soldier will not hiss or spread its pinchers wide this time. Be ready to block a second after you see it leaning back, just as it's about to lunge forward to perfect block this one. This is a good one to try to get the perfect block, as failing to block at all will generally result in the character being stunned, unable to do anything for a moment while taking damage. The next is a 3 hit combo. This starts very similar to the last two moves. The soldier leans back, but this time at a slight angle before lunging forward after a slight delay with a 3 hit attack. This can hit devastatingly hard if not blocked. Thankfully this attack is very well telegraphed and the attacks are all executed in perfect rhythm. Perfect blocking any attack during this combo will cancel the combo out. But, if possible, it's always best to block that first hit, blocking a second after the soldier leans back just before it thrusts forward. 
The final attack is a sawdust toss. The soldier will lower its head in the ground and after a short delay, thrust upwards, spreading sawdust in a small area around it. This unblockable attack does light to moderate damage. However, the bigger threat is the debuff it applies. It's the same as the dust mites. It slows the player, reduces their stamina regen, and reduces their damage for a brief moment. As this attack is unblockable, the best thing to do is to simply back up. Soldiers are moderately tanky and can dish out some serious damage if you're not careful. Additionally, many of its attacks look nearly the same, which can make reacting properly a little difficult. Once you understand that all three of those attacks are released in nearly identical timing, the termite soldier becomes a lot easier, actually. If you ever see the soldier rearing back, simply ready yourself to block a second later, and always assume it's going to be the three-hit combo. If it does not release the second attack after half a second, you know you're safe to drop your guard and start attacking. What does start to get difficult though, is that you're inevitably going to be fighting multiple soldiers and workers at the same time. As best as possible, kite them backwards to reduce how many can hit you at once. And, whenever possible, always prioritize killing the workers first. They are squishier, and they can lob heavy damaging acid shots at you from at the back of the crowd. This will often be your downfall in many group fights. Take your time when soldiers enter group fights. Fight defensively, unless you can get some really quick pokes in on the workers. Then it's worth being a little bit more aggressive. Bring lots of heals, and be patient. I promise you'll clear the termite den in no time. The Termite King stands large and imposing. He's the mighty ruler of the termites inhabiting the inner sanctum of the termite den. He's 25% weak to salty and stabbing, but resists fresh and slashing by 50% and generic by 25%. He's also completely immune to dust. As for prepping gear, use the same setup I recommended for termite workers. Just refer back to them. I do have one addition though. If you have them, this would be a good time to bring Splat Burst, not Brat Burst, Splat Burst, to take out the army of workers around the king. The Termite King may look ominous, but he's really just a bigger, tankier soldier that does less damage. He shares the same moveset as the Termite Soldier, minus the Sawdust Toss. His first attack is a side swipe. The king will lean to its side before quickly lunging forward for a moderately damaging bite. This attack has little wind up, so when you see it lean to the side, get ready to block right away to execute the perfect block. These next three attacks look very similar and can be very difficult to distinguish from one another. Luckily, the timing is similar. The first of these three is its charged bite. The king will rear back with its pinchers wide while hissing at you menacingly before lunging forward for a heavy attack. To execute the perfect block, wait until he has leaned back and be ready to block a second later as the king lunges. This attack has a high chance of stunning you if not perfect block. The next is a stunning bite, very similar to the charge bite. However, the king will not hiss or spread its pinchers wide. Be ready to block immediately after you see it leaning back to perfect block this one. This attack is executed faster than the soldiers, so be ready to block earlier. Failing to perfect block this attack will typically result in your character being stunned. The next is a three hit combo. This starts very similar to the last two moves. The king leans back, but this time at a slight angle before lunging forward after a slight delay with a three hit attack. This can hit hard Thankfully, this attack is well telegraphed and the attacks are all executed in perfect rhythm. Perfect blocking any attack during this combo will cancel the combo out. But possible, it's always best to block that first hit, blocking a second after the king leads back just before it thrusts forward. When facing the termite king, the biggest threat is actually the many workers surrounding him. It's inevitable that you're going to be bombarded by many acid shots. But the best strategy is to try to take out the workers first. I mentioned bringing splat bursts earlier. Chuck them on a worker and back up, funneling them through the tunnels to quickly take them out. Just always be careful to stay out of range so you don't blow yourself up. Once the workers are taken care of, the king is up next. Don't worry too much, all he is is a tankier soldier. Although you should be cautious of his windup animations, as he releases his attacks faster than the soldiers. 
The good news is his attacks don't hit nearly as hard as the soldier, but in exchange they're able to stun you if you block him properly. The king goes down without much fuss, honestly, but if you're struggling, bring a friend and you can pretty much infinitely stun lock him. Another option is to kite the king to a narrow point in the tunnels. When he's confined in these tight areas, he seems to execute fewer attacks as he's not able to move around as much. Use this to your advantage to get in many free attacks. Black Whittlings are 50% weak to spicy, but 25% resistant to fresh and stabbing, and thanks to data miners we know they also resist generic. They're also 50% resistant to poison. It might seem a little odd to put Black Whittlings this early in the tier 3 list. However, there are a number of Black Whittling lairs, where there's no Black Widows in these, scattered throughout the upper yard containing easy to obtain tier 3 bug parts. Things like black ox horns, green shield bug parts, and roly poly parts, among others. Black spiderlings are not particularly challenging, but because you encounter them in groups, it's easy to become overwhelmed with your health being whittled down attack after attack. So some basic prep is recommended. For armor, really anything works for this, but if you're struggling, medium or heavy armor is going to help you take more attacks. Something like Ladybug, Black Ant, Antlion, or Roly Poly. For weapons, I wouldn't worry so much about bringing a weapon they're weak to, as they have very little health. Any tier 2 or tier 3 weapon can really get the job done here. But if you have a spicy infused weapon, like the Coltana or Spicy Staff, definitely bring it. When it comes to mutations, normally we'd activate Mithridatism to counteract the poison. But Black Widows and Black Whittlings don't inflict poison. They inflict venom, which completely bypasses the Mithridatism mutation. That said, use your typical mutation preferences. Meat Shield, Buff Lungs, Parry Master, Cardio Fan, Coup de Grass, Trapper Keeper. But definitely keep room to turn on Spicy Safety. Black Whittlings attacks are stabbing damage. Rank 2 of Spicy Safety will reduce their damage by 50%. You don't need to go overboard with heals. Still bring some bandages and a few smoothies of your choice just in case things go south. Just like the regular spiderlings, they only possess one attack, a charged lunge, which they telegraph by leaning backwards and then thrusting forward. This can be perfect block just as the whittling lunges forward. Some general tips for whittlings is to fight aggressively, but not so much so that you run out of stamina. Whittlings are found in groups and can quickly overwhelm you, so killing them as quickly as possible is important to survive. If you are struggling with them, be sure to only break open one web nest at a time to reduce the number of whittlings you have to deal with. Roly polies come in two forms, the regular roly poly and the sickly roly poly. Prior to full release, sickly roly polies had separate drops that were used to make the crusty roly poly armor. This is no longer the case. Sickly roly polies are simply a weaker version of the regular roly poly. However, their weaknesses do differ slightly. Sickly roly polies are weak to spicy by 25%, busting by 50%, and thanks to data miners, we know they're also weak to generic damage by 25%. This is for weapons like the mint mace or ant clubs. They resist salty, fresh, chopping, and slashing by 25%, and stabbing by 50%. Regular roly polies are weak to fresh, salty, and spicy by 25%, and busting by 50%. They also have a weak point on their legs, although it can be very difficult to hit them there. They resist chopping, slashing, and stabbing by 25%. This enemy is one of the tankiest in the game. They are very slow, but hit extremely hard when they attack. Additionally, they have the ability to regenerate their health in large chunks. This prolongs the fight. As such, a healthy amount of prep is recommended. We talked about this before when we discussed how to fight the wolf spider, but if you haven't done so yet, you need to be collecting milk molars. At this point, you could easily have 30 some regular white milk molars to upgrade your character. Extra health and stamina are always great, but don't neglect healing. It will greatly increase the healing effect of any healing item you use, such as roasts or smoothies. You definitely want to be putting points into upgrading your max mutations as well. 
These upgrades, you're definitely going to need them for the upper yard when you're dealing with enemies like the Roly Poly. For armor, you surely want to go into this tanky. Ladybug, Black Ant, Ant Lion at plus 6 or higher is recommended. If you have it, Roly Poly armor is even better. For weapons, the best choice for both types of Roly Polies is going to be a hammer. Either the tier 2 insect hammer, or even better, the tier 3 black ox hammer at plus 6 or higher. For the sickly roly poly, the spicy staff is great. For the regular roly poly, the fresh staff or spicy staff are extremely effective, ideally at plus 5 or better. The tier 2 red ant club, or the tier 3 fire ant club will get the job done as well. I highly recommend bringing a good shield if using a one-handed weapon like the hammer, as the roly-poly will chunk your health if you block him properly. The fire ant shield is particularly effective here, as it's going to reduce the defense of the roly-poly. For general prep, be sure to set up a lean-to as it is easy to die. Bring several bandages and beefy smoothies. A good smoothie choice would be liquid rage for more damage, human food for added defense, or green machine for hyper stamina. For meals, spider slider or larvania if you're going to have the mutation coup de grass and trapper keeper equipped. Otherwise, mite loaf or fungus pacho for extra attack stamina or black ox burgers for more defense. Although the black ox burgers are currently bugged as of 1.5 and are only increasing defense by 2%. This is likely a rounding error that's going to be corrected in a later patch. For mutations, survivability is paramount, so meat shield and spicy safety are almost a necessity. Spicy safety will substantially reduce the damage of more than half of the roly Pulley's attacks. Crits are very powerful here to stun the enemy out of its attacks, so I'd turn on Coup de Grass and Trapper Peeper. The last mutation is up to you. Both roly Pulleys have five attacks. First is a headbutt. When at close range, the roly poly will sway its head to its side before headbutting you for moderately heavy damage. This attack is not well telegraphed and is executed quickly, making it very dangerous. To perfect block, block one second after you see it sway its head. Be warned, any block or perfect block from any of the roly poly's attacks will still cause you to be knocked back. The second attack is a head sweep. When at close or mid to close range, the roly poly will begin to sway its head, just like as if it were going to do the headbutt. However, this time, it will begin to turn its head to the opposite side, charging it up for two seconds before ramming you with massive damage. Because this attack is so slow, perfect blocking can be tricky. Wait for it to turn its head to the side, count to two seconds before blocking to execute the perfect block. As before, you will still be knocked back either way. The third move is a cannonball. The roly poly will launch itself in the air, curling itself up into a cannonball before dropping down on you for massive and often lethal damage. This is the most devastating attack in the roly poly's arsenal and can easily catch you by surprise. The perfect block, pull up your shield when the roly poly is at the top of its jump. The fourth attack is a charged roll. When at mid or long distance, the roly poly will attempt to catch up with you by using this attack. It will telegraph this by curling itself up into a ball and begin to roll in place before dashing at you swiftly. This attack hits for massive damage but is one of the easier ones to block. There's two ways to deal with this attack. Stay at long distance and be ready to block a moment after it charges towards you. Or place an immovable object between you like a boulder or a branch. If you decide to perfect block, block slightly earlier than you think. As soon as the roly poly launches towards you, you need to block a split second later. If you wait to block until it's nearly on you, your blocking animation is too slow and you will get hit. Its final move is a defense curl. The roly poly will ball itself up upside down and begin to heal itself for up to a third of its health bar. While in this attack animation, it takes greatly reduced damage. However, it will do nothing to retaliate. 
Take this moment to heal yourself up if needed, but my recommendation is to continue attacking the roly-poly to minimize how much it heals for it. It is possible to stun the roly-poly out of this attack animation. It takes a great deal of damage, but in all my attempts while recording, I couldn't make this happen. This may seem like a good strategy, but it's really not ideal, as the roly-poly will continue to heal, yet it will now be capable of attacking you. My feeling is to go ham on it regardless, and if you do stun it out of its animation, it is what it is. Roly-polies are a big step up in difficulty, requiring high DPS and careful blocking to come out the victor. Be very aggressive, but always ready to block. They may seem overwhelming at first, but just remember this one little trick. All of its attacks are just a one-hit combo, so if you mess up your blocks, just be sure to heal. As long as you brought enough smoothies, you really have nothing to fear. If you find yourself unable to kill them, like they're healing for more than you're damaging them, you have a DPS problem. This is a good time to look critically at your weapons and make sure you're using the best thing you possibly could be using and upgrading it as much as you're able to. It is possible to stun the roly-poly. However, this is very difficult to achieve and will generally only happen once per battle. You see, there's a 120 second cooldown on stunning it. You would need a very high stun rated weapon, like the Club of the Mother Demon, Mint Mace, or Fire Ant Club to reliably achieve this. If you do get lucky and stun it, try to jump on top of it and wail on its soft underbelly for massive damage. Ladybirds are the older, angrier sister of the ladybugs. They are 50% weak to fresh and busting, 25% weak to generic, and have a weak point on their legs. But she resists salty, spicy, and stabbing by 25%. Ladybirds are very tanky and extremely tough, quickly taking you from full health to dead in a split second if you're not careful. As such, careful preparation is recommended. As ladybugs hit extremely hard, tanky armor is recommended. Roly-poly, ladybug, black ox, or fire ant at plus 7 or higher. For weapons, one of the best for the job is undoubtedly the mint mace at plus 5 or higher, as this will have a combined 75% extra damage against the ladybird. If you're feeling bougie, a fresh infused hammer like the black ox hammer at plus 5 or better will inflict 100% extra damage. Other good choices are the mint staff for 50% extra damage, and the club of the mother demon or fire ant club for 25% more damage. All at plus 6 or higher is my recommendation. If you're finding the ladybird too difficult, I strongly recommend using a one-handed weapon like the Black Ox Hammer and combine it with a good shield like the Fire Ant Shield. The Fire Ant Shield has a chance of reducing the enemy's defense. For ranged players, you're going to have a harder time as the Ladybug is pretty resistant to arrows. A good setup, however, would be to use Moth Armor to inflict bleed and or Bomb Arrows with a Black Ox Crossbow at plus 6 or higher to maximize your damage. If you know you're going ladybird hunting, you should try to put down a lean-to in a nearby area so you don't have to travel far in case you die. Always have a few bandages on hand and several roast or beefy smoothies of your choice. I recommend human food for damage resistance or liquid rage for increased damage. A meal can go a long way as well here. I like Black Ox Burgers for extra defense. As I've mentioned previously, this meal is currently bugged and is likely going to be fixed in a future patch or Larvania or Spider Slider if using crit mutations. Mutation-wise, run your preferences, but some good options are Meat Shield, Parry Master, Cardio Fan, Kuda Grass, and Trapper Peeper. But save room for spicy safety, as this will reduce the damage of one of its attacks. Ladybirds have similar attacks as the Ladybugs. They have six total moves. The first is a long distance dash. If the player is at mid or long range, the ladybird will telegraph this attack by putting its front two legs together, raising itself up before quickly charging at the player, inflicting massive and sometimes lethal damage. This charge is faster than the ladybugs, and she will chase for a much longer distance. This move is easy to perfect block by blocking at the moment the attack is about to hit you. 
The second is a headbutt. The ladybird will rear up on its hind legs and quickly smash its head into the player for heavy damage. This attack is deceptively fast and difficult to block. The perfect block, block right before the lunge forward, about a half a second after it starts the attack animation. The third move is a battle cry. The ladybird will begin to shake before raising its head and shouting a loud roar. This move will slightly heal it. The fourth is a side ram. Depending on if you're on its left or its right side, she will twist her body in the opposite direction before ramming at you with her full weight for massive damage. Once the ladybird has turned its body, be ready to block at the very moment to perfect block this one. Her fifth attack is a two-hit slam combo. She will raise herself up on either your left or right side and immediately slam down on you with her full weight twice in a row. Each hit by itself does massive damage and knockback, but if you're hit by both, you will probably find yourself dead. Definitely master the perfect block on this one. Block as the ladybird is at the top of its leap, raising herself up. If you perfect block the first attack, you will cancel the combo out, knocking her back. The final move you will only see if you decide to jump on top of the ladybird. It's a buck attack. You will shake before wildly bucking the player off of it. This unblockable attack hits extremely hard and can one or two hit kill you, so it's best to avoid this tactic entirely. Don't underestimate the ladybird. This is no ladybug fight. Chances are you're going to be fighting a lot of these, spoiler alert, as their shells are necessary for making supreme plating, a recipe you get for defeating Director Schmechter. In the long term, one of the best things you can do is just practice blocking this enemy's attacks. Really become comfortable and familiar with its moveset, and just like any enemy, she's going to get much easier to take out. The other thing you can do to make this fight easier is be sure you're using the best weapons possible against her, the Mint Mace or Fresh Infused Black Ox Hammer. These weapons will chunk the Ladybird's health, ending the fight as quickly as possible. Fire Ants are the Tier 3 version of Ants. Workers are 50% weak to Fresh, but 75% resistant to Spicy. They also have a weak point on their eyes. These guys are moderately tanky and can put out decent damage, so you don't want to underestimate them, especially if you're taking on their anthill. If that is your goal, you're going to need to go heavy on prep, as this anthill is the biggest yet. For armor, most sets can get the job done, but if you're struggling, medium or heavy armor from tier 3 is going to help you take less damage. Something like Roly Poly, Black Ox, Fire Ant, or even sleek ladybug armor, all preferably at plus six or better. Regarding weapons, while workers don't resist any weapon damage type, the soldiers do. I'm gonna cover them next. As such, I would avoid using any chopping or slashing weapons like the termite axe, any swords, or any daggers. You know, unless you're running a specific build like poison, then you obviously have to use what you have to use. The mint mace and mint staff are extremely powerful here, but there's lots of other viable choices. Club of the Mother Demon, Salt Morning Star, Fire Ant Club, or Rusty Spear, all at plus six or better. For Rangers, the Black Ox Crossbow with Splinter Arrows and Bomb Arrows or Mint Arrows, again at plus six or better. If you have it, an undervalued and underutilized weapon, the Sour Staff, does extremely well in confined areas of the ant hills. Fire charge shots down the tunnel and laugh as enemy after enemy gets stunned. Most of the tunnel is very dark, so you should also bring a good torch. At this point, you really should invest in an ever charged torch and even a stack of flares to free up your hands for a shield if you go one handed. Now the Fire Ant Hill is a big place with lots of loot and lots of enemies, so my recommendation is to set up a lean-to outside whatever entrance you choose and to bring an acorn chest. There's more loot in here than you can carry. Bring 10 or more bandages, 15 or more beefy smoothies of your choice, and two good meals. For smoothies, I recommend human food or liquid rage. For meals, Spider Slider or Lorvania are always great if you run Kuda Grass and Trapper Peeper. Otherwise, Black Ox Burgers for defense and health, or Fungus Pacho or Mite Low for attack stamina. 
Also bring a few shinobi sneezes to give yourself some breathing room to retreat if things become overwhelming. Lastly, your mutations. Run whatever combat mutations you prefer at this point. Meat Shield, Cardio Fan, Parry Master, Coup de Grass, Trapper Peeper, or weapon specific mutations like Barbarian. But be sure to save room for Ant Annihilator for extra damage and defense against ants. Fire Ant Workers have three attacks. The first is a Charge Bite. The Fire Ant will rear itself backwards and begin to clitter, and one and a half seconds later will lunge forward with a moderately damaging bite. The perfect block, wait for it to lean back, and after one and a half seconds, pull up your guard to perfect block. The second attack is a standard bite. The Fire Ant will begin to clitter and lunge forward for a light to moderately damaging bite. This attack is not well telegraphed and is easy to miss. To perfect block, block as soon as you hear it clitter. Its final attack is an acid shot. The fire ant will begin to heave with its entire body and a split second later lob a large acid shot towards the player. This is the same as the termite worker. This unblockable attack hits for heavy damage and has surprisingly far range and accuracy. If you're hit, this attack will also apply a short debuff, lowering your defense. So the best strategy is to strafe left or right to avoid this attack entirely. Worth noting, once the acid hits the ground, unlike the bombardier beetles, the acid will not apply a damage over time, so feel free to fight in it. For the most part, fire ants fight the same as the red or black ants. The only new trick you need to watch out for is that acid shot. Because of this, just like with the termites, your priority should be to always take out the workers first. When fighting in the ant hill, it is very easy to become overwhelmed with a large number of enemies. Do your best to aggro as few enemies as possible, one at a time, and kite them backwards to minimize how many attackers can hit you simultaneously. If possible, bringing flares can be a big help here. Much of the ant hill is dark, a torch would normally tie up your offhand, making you unable to use a shield, but the flare frees up that hand, allowing you to have one equipped. No matter what tactic you choose, fight smart and defensively, and be ready to throw a shinobi sneeze to give yourself an opening to retreat to heal up when you need to. Fire soldier ants are 50% weak to fresh and have a weak point on their eyes. They're 75% resistant to spicy, 50% resistant to slashing, and 25% resistant to chopping. Fire soldier ants behave the same way as red and black soldier ants, they simply have more health and deal more damage. For prep, refer back to the fire ant workers, nothing further is required. They have four attacks. These are the same exact attacks as red soldier ants. The first is a charge bite, which is only performed at short range. The soldier will pull back his head and hiss before slightly lunging forward with a strong attack. The hiss is delayed, so pay attention looking for the soldier to shake its head, indicating the attack is incoming. This can be perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the soldier lunges forward. The second attack is an aggressive charge bite, which can be made into a three hit combo. This attack is better telegraphed. The soldier will hiss, lean back deeply before lunging with a slight delay. The first attack hits particularly hard and is occasionally followed up with two very fast side swipes. It's best to perfect block the initial hit, blocking the moment the soldier lunges forward. If you miss the first attack, don't panic, but begin flicking block immediately to try to perfect block the next two attacks. Any perfect block during this combo will cancel the combo out thanks to the knockback. The third attack is a side swipe. The soldier will pivot its head slightly to your left or right and immediately come in with a moderately damaging bite. This attack is executed quickly and can be difficult to block. To perfect block, block just as the soldier pivots its head to the side. Its final attack is a stunning bite. This attack is similar to the charge bite, but is telegraphed slightly different. This time, the soldier will lean back, but not hiss or spread its jaws, a second later lunging forward. This attack hits for moderate to light damage, 
but can stun you if blocked improperly. The timing of this attack is also tricky to perfect block. As soon as you see the soldier lean back, be ready to block a second later. For the most part, fire ants fight the same as red or black ants. It's inevitable that worker ants and soldiers are going to be mixed when fighting in the ant hill. Because of this, just like with the termites, your priority should always be to take out the workers first. Stay on your toes, circling the enemies or strafing to avoid the occasional acid shots. When fighting in the ant hill, it is very easy to become overwhelmed with a large number of enemies. Do your best to aggro as few as possible and kite them backwards to minimize how many attacks you can take simultaneously. If possible, bringing flares can be a big help here. Much of the ant hill is dark, a torch would normally tie up your offhand making you unable to use a shield, but the flare frees up that offhand so you can now equip one. No matter what tactic you choose, fight smart and defensively and be ready to throw a shinobi sneeze to give yourself an opening to retreat and heal up if you need to. Blackhawks beetles are 25% weak to salty and busting, and they have a weak point on their belly. They are 25% resistant to chopping, slashing, and stabbing. The Blackhawks beetle is a burly and intimidating foe. It is both tanky and devastatingly powerful, and is typically found in pairs. Unless you are heavily overgeared or confident in your skills, these enemies should not be taken lightly. As such, I recommend a healthy amount of prep. For armor, any build can work, but if you're struggling, tier 3 medium or heavy armor will help you a lot. Something like Roly Poly, Black Ox, Fire Ant, or even Sleek sorry. Ladybug all at plus 7 or better. For weapons, the Black Ox Beetle is one of the few land creatures weak to Salty. It can be very worthwhile to upgrade a Black Ox Hammer to Salty, ideally plus 7 or better. Spoiler, as you'll likely be killing many of this enemy to make Supreme Whetstones with an endgame recipe that you get from defeating Director Schmechter. Other good weapon choices include the Salt Morningstar, Club of the Mother Demon, Fire Ant Club, or ranged options like the Spicy Staff, Sour Staff, or Black Ox Crossbow with Salty Arrows. Again, all at plus 7 or better. If using a one-handed weapon, a shield is very helpful. Both the Ladybird and Fire Ant Shield are effective here. The Fire Ant Shield can lower the Beetle's defense whereas the Ladybird Shield will allow you to block more attacks before becoming stunned. If you know you're going Black Ox Beetle hunting, set up a lean-to in the nearby area, as it's pretty easy to die. Bring 5-10 to 10 beefy smoothies of your choice, my preference is human food for added defense, or liquid rage for increased damage. Never forget to bring a few bandages, and if fighting in a group, a few heal bosses. A meal can also be very helpful, Larvania or Spider Slider if using crit mutations, Mite Loaf or Fungus Pacho for attack stamina, or Black Ox Burgers for added defense and health. Much like the Roly Poly, this is going to be a long fight, so having the right mutations can make things easier. Some good options include Meat Shield, Parry Master, Cardio Fan, Coup de Grass, Trapper Peeper, but be sure to save room for Spicy Safety, as this is going to dramatically reduce the damage of three of its five attacks. As I mentioned, the Black Ox Beetle has five attacks. The first is a rock throw. The Black Ox Beetle will telegraph this by lowering its head into the ground, and a moment later aggressively flicking it upward, tossing a boulder at the player for heavy damage. This attack is typically used when at mid or long range, but sometimes even at short range. It can hit you with surprising accuracy and distance. This attack is blockable, but still inflicts quite a bit of damage unless perfect blocked. Perfect block by blocking just before the boulder hits you. Block a little early as it's moving pretty fast. And oddly enough, the boulder can still damage you even when it's laying completely motionless on the ground. The player should always be circling the Black Ox Beetle as this attack can easily be dodged when doing so. The second attack is a charge. When at mid or long range, the Black Ox Beetle will attempt to catch up with the player with this move. It will telegraph this by dragging its front two feet on the ground and a moment later charge with agile speed. This attack will inflict massive and sometimes lethal damage, but thankfully is easy to block. Perfect block just before the beetle reaches the player. The third attack is a horn stab. 
the black ox beetle will sway its head and slightly lean back before thrusting its horn aggressively at the player for moderate to heavy damage. This attack is executed quickly and can be tricky to catch. When you see it lean back, be ready to block a moment later to perfect block this one. The fourth attack is a spinning headbutt. This attack has very little wind up. Black Ox Beetle will turn its head to your left and immediately ram you for heavy damage, then twist its body around presenting its rump. The wiki claims that the beetle kicks dust at you when it turns around. However, in all my tests this never happened. This attack is one of the hardest to block as there's really no tell to prepare for it. If you have fast reflexes, perfect block by blocking the moment you see its head move to the side. Its final move is its most devastating, a wild thrash attack. It starts its attack by slightly swaying its head from left to right, before executing a wild multi-hit thrash. Each hit inflicts massive damage, but if you react poorly and are hit by more than one, you will likely die. Each hit is executed with wildly different timing, making this very difficult to perfect block if you miss the first attack. Perfect block the first hit by blocking immediately after it sways its head from left to right. This will end the combo. If you miss blocking the first hit, immediately back up and begin flicking the block button to attempt to interrupt its combo. By backing up, a few of the hits will miss you entirely, and with some luck you will survive the attack. As black ox beetles are commonly found in pairs, your first task is to separate them. Fight your target far away with a shot from your trusty bow. For melee combat, fight defensively and punish with a couple of attacks when possible. Always heal up to full to avoid being one shot on its next move. Be patient and the black ox beetles and eventually go down. Range combat is often the safer option. A fire staff is ideal. Be sure to equip the mutation Little Wizard for burning damage over time. But a Black Ox crossbow with salty arrows can get the job done, as long as you're able to quickly switch to a melee weapon to block when you need to. Keep yourself at far range at all times and lob attacks at it as often as possible, but always ready to strafe the boulder tosses or block its charges. With practice and upgrades to your gear, Black Ox beetles will start to go down easier and easier. Keep at it, I know you guys got this. Spiny water fleas are 50% weak to sour and 25% weak to stabbing. They're 25% resistant to fresh and 50% resistant to chopping, which is kind of funny because you can't use axes underwater. This enemy is an upgrade to the regular water flea. It has spines covering its arms and tails. They are located in most water in the upper yard, including the stump surrounding, undershed, and moldark highlands. They are mostly positioned to defend pond moss. By itself, spiny water fleas are not a big deal. Unfortunately, you typically encounter them in groups of 10 or more. They have a very aggressive swarm behavior, which will quickly overwhelm you. As such, I wouldn't go into this lightly, be sure to prepare. No particular armor is necessary, but as always, a tankier armor will reduce the damage you take. Plus 7 or higher is recommended. As you'll be fighting underwater, the only weapon types you can use are spears and daggers. The best weapons for the job are the Rusty Spear, Sour Infusion really helps, or the Widow Dagger at plus 7 or better. Honestly, until you have the Widow Dagger, there's really no point on taking on the Spiny Water Fleas, as their drops are quite lackluster. You can get meat and a low, low chance for Pawn Moss. It's best to avoid them entirely until you have that dagger, as it is necessary to harvest the Pawn Moss that they guard. For the rest of your prep, it is helpful to have a few beefy smoothies and bandages. For smoothies, this is going to be one of the rare times I'm going to recommend Liquid Gills, as this dramatically increases your breath timer while underwater. You see, you really can't sacrifice your armor for the Gill Tube or Bubble Helmet, as you need that armor to tank the many attacks you're going to be taking. A sticky questionable slop for health regen is also very helpful here. For meals, Quesadilla Antlion or Omelant for its thorns is great to reflect back damage, or Tadpoloka Pudding or Boatman Fin Soup for a variety of water buffs. The water fleas have but one single attack, 
a stabby stab. This attack does light damage, but the water flea can repeat this attack in quick succession. Combine this with being attacked by a dozen or more enemies at once, and your health is going to deplete quite quickly. This attack is stabbing damage, so you should absolutely have the spicy safety mutation equipped to reduce this by 50%. This is a simple enemy that's a pain in the ass to fight. Prepare carefully and go in very aggressive, trying to take out the enemies one by one as quickly as possible. Pay attention to your health bar and heal as needed. The Sour Staff is actually really useful here, although you obviously will have needed to get the Pod Moss first to make it. I like to stand above the water and shoot charge shots into the depths below to soften the enemies up before I jump in. Don't try to kite the enemy to shore. This doesn't work. The enemy's AI is programmed to flee rapidly when you attempt this tactic. Ticks are 50% weak to spicy, but 25% resistant to fresh, and 50% resistant to salty, busting, and generic. Generic is for weapons like the Mint Mace or Fire Ant Club. Ticks are commonly found in groups and inflict surprisingly high damage, so they should not be taken lightly. These are no mites. No special preparation is needed. However, a couple beefy smoothies, some bandages, and a good set of armor and weapon at plus six or better is recommended. For weapons, the spicy staff or Kultana is going to make short work of this enemy, but they don't have a ton of health, so really any fast weapon will get the job done here, ideally at plus six or better. Just avoid those slow weapons like clubs and hammers and maces if possible. The ticks are a simple creature. You will only have to worry about one move, a close range jumping attack. This attack inflicts moderate damage, but is easily perfect blocked by blocking at the moment the tick is in the air. Be warned, it can repeat this attack in quick succession, quickly overwhelming you, especially when you're facing more than one tick at a time. Similar to the tier one lawn mites, fight aggressively to take them out quickly. However, as they do hit much harder, be sure to always block when you see it jumping. Failure to block a few hits will quickly result in your death. As if regular mosquitoes weren't annoying enough, now we have the tiger mosquito. They have a 50% weakness to fresh and a 25% weakness to chopping and slashing, but they are 50% resistant to busting and generic. Tiger Mosquitoes are agile, and they hit very hard, so I wouldn't attempt to take them on until you have armor and weapons at plus 7 or better. The armor choice is up to you, but if you're struggling, roly pull your Black Ox armor will help you tank the attacks. The Mint Mace is very good here, the only downside is its slow swing speed. Other good options include the Termite Axe, Toenail Scimitar, Antlion Greatsword, Tikmakyo Huito, or Sour Staff. Tiger mosquitoes tend to come in small swarms, especially around the Maldor Castle, making it challenging to endure their onslaught, so additional prep is recommended. Bring plenty of bandages and beefy smoothies, liquid rage or human food is my preference, and if possible, a fire ant or ladybird shield unless you're confident. If you're hunting tiger mosquitoes, be sure to throw down a lean-to in case you die. You can use whatever mutations you prefer, but be sure to save room for spicy safety as rank 2 is going to reduce the damage of all of the tiger mosquitoes attacks by 50%. Tiger mosquitoes have the same three attacks as regular mosquitoes. The first is a powerful stab. The mosquito will buzz while leaning backwards with its nose pointing straight at you before thrusting aggressively for moderately heavy damage. Like all of its attacks, any damage it inflicts can heal the mosquito. This attack can be perfect blocked by blocking just as the mosquito thrusts forward at the player. The second is a loop-de-loop -loop thrust. It will start by buzzing, then perform a loop in the air before charging at the player for significant damage. This move is well telegraphed and can be easily perfect blocked by blocking just before the attack hits you. Its final attack is its most devastating, a three hit combo. This move is not well telegraphed and hits extremely hard. The mosquito will come into close range and begin to sway side to side before launching a quick three hit stab from side to side. To perfect block, 
watch for the mosquito to start swaying side to side and be quick to block the instant it attacks. Perfect blocking any attack in this combo is going to cancel the combo out. Many factors make this fight challenging. Tiger mosquitoes are agile and will frequently fly out of range of your melee attacks. When they do come close, they're always coming in for an attack and leave only a small opening once they're finished. They also tend to spawn near other mosquitoes and other major threats like ticks, spiny water fleas, and ladybird larvae. You need to find a good balance between defense and aggressive offense. Always be ready to block, but then ready to immediately counterattack aggressively. And don't forget to heal. If you have friends, a good strategy is to have someone take the hits with the heavy armor and a shield, while your friend comes in from the side or behind to inflict heavy damage while the mosquito is stuck in his attack animation. Green shield bugs are 50% weak to fresh and 25% weak to stabbing. They're 75% resistant to spicy and 25% resistant to generic and completely immune to gas. Fought correctly without cheesing, green shield bugs should not be taken lightly. At a glance, they look like tankier stink bugs, but their heavy damage and extra powerful gas can really give you trouble if you go in unprepared. So be smart and prep up. As always, for your armor, you can use whatever you want, but if you're struggling, you should stick to tier 3 medium or heavy armor. Something like bulky roly poly, black ox, or fire ant, all at plus 7 or better. For weapons, the mint mace or mint staff are very powerful here. The rusty spear is also a great option. Fresh infusion will make this even better, making a combined 75% extra damage. Many other weapons work too. Just avoid its resistances with weapons like clubs, the fire staff, coltana, or gas arrows. Whatever weapon you use, be sure to upgrade it to plus 7 or better. A shield isn't necessary, but can be helpful if you're using a one-handed weapon. These next steps are extremely important. The shield bug releases gas that is even more deadly than the stink bugs, so you're going to need a way to avoid that. Normally, you'd think to just equip a gas mask, but the green shield bug puts out some serious damage and can break your flimsy mask in no time. If you choose to use a mask, you should definitely bring at least two and make sure that your first one is upgraded to plus five or better. In my opinion, the better option is to go in with several sticky gastro goo smoothies. This smoothie will protect you from gas damage. You can use gum as a base to increase the duration of the buff. This is really helpful here as this fight may take a long time, especially if you're fighting in a group as the enemy has a hefty health bar. Good meal would be Spider Slider or Larvania if using crit mutations. Otherwise, Mite Loaf or Fungus Pacho for attack stamina, or Black Ox Burgers for more health and damage resistance. The Green Shield Bug has one new move, all of its others are the same as the standard stink bug. The first move is a belly flop gas attack. The Shield Bug will dip its head while raising its abdomen up on its hind legs before leaping at the player, belly flopping and releasing its gas in a wide circumference. The belly flop itself hits for massive damage, not to mention the deadly gas it releases. It's best to back up and block right before the attack hits to perfect block this one. Sometimes this attack will miss entirely. And as long as you have the gas mask on or gastro goose smoothie active, you will take no damage from the gas. The second attack is a gas release. The shield bug will begin making a buzzing noise and lower its entire body towards the ground, slightly shaking, before releasing a massive cloud of gas in the surrounding area. As before, as long as you have the mask or gastro goose smoothie active, this attack is harmless and should be punished heavily. The third is a bite. The green shield bug will start by buzzing heavily, then shaking its head before biting at the player. This attack hits for heavy damage and can be perfect blocked by blocking right before the attack connects to the player. Its final move, I like to call a toot and scoot. If the green shield bug is taking damage in between attacks, it may choose to use this defensive tactic. It will raise itself up, 
quickly charging its gas and immediately releasing it, propelling itself backwards and far out of range. Take this moment to heal up if you need to, otherwise pursue your enemy or reposition for better footing. As with the stink bug, the green shield bug's greatest weapon is its gas. This super gas does dramatically more damage than the stink bugs, so it's necessary to be prepared to negate it. My preference has always been to use Gastro Goo, as this frees up your helmet slot for tankier armor. It's also less risky, as the gas mask has terrible durability and will often break in this fight due to the green shield bug's massive damage output. As much as I enjoy fighting large bugs with friends, they're almost a detriment here. As with all enemies, the more players you bring into the fight, the more health the enemy gets. But this enemy gets a massive amount of extra health per additional player. If you do this as a team, take advantage of the fact that the shield bug can only attack in one direction at a time. One player should aggro and tank it, while the others go in behind and wail on its rear. Infected wolf spiders are the behemoths, the alpha predator of the infected class. If you're planning to take on an infected wolf spider, you might want to take a moment and ask yourself, why? They don't have particularly good drops, and they're a pain in the ass to fight. That said, it's still an experience to do so, so for glory, we will press on. They are 50% weak to fresh, and 25% weak to spicy, busting, and slashing. They are 50% resistant to salty, stabbing, and explosive, and are 90% resistant to poison. Infected wolf spiders are the most punishing and intense one-on-one -on -one fight in the game. Even cheesing it has its challenges. No matter how well you fight, you will be taking massive, massive damage, so you need to prep heavily. As for gear, the number one thing you can do to make this fight easier is to farm for the fungal charm. The drop rate is low, but you have a chance of finding this every time you break one of the fungal plants. This charm will reduce explosive damage by 75%, which is crucial to reduce the infected wolf spider's damage output. If you can't get the charm, your second best option is going to be a sleek gas mask. This will also reduce explosive damage by 75%, the downside is that the gas mask is very fragile and it's likely going to break in your fight. The fight is so fast paced, you're not going to have enough time to equip a second one. If you choose to use a gas mask, it might be worth it to upgrade it all the way to plus 9 for some extra durability. The rest of your armor is largely up to you, but I wouldn't attempt this with light armor. You're just going to take too much damage. My recommendation is bulky roly poly or any other tier 3 medium or heavy armor upgraded to plus 8 or plus 9. For your weapons, three of the best are going to be the Mint Mace, Mint Staff, and the Coltana. Both will inflict 50% extra damage. If you happen to have a slashing weapon infused with fresh, something like the Antlion Greatsword, or Tick Makihoitl, or however you pronounce that, you can get your bonus damage up to 75%. With the holiday update, the ability to block with your bow has become a thing, so it's going to be possible to do this with ranged combat, albeit it's not the ideal setup. You'll want the Black Ox crossbow and mint arrows also at plus 8 or plus 9. Whatever you choose, I recommend upgrading your gear to plus 8 or plus 9 to end the fight as quickly as possible. Now, you're going to need to go very heavy on preparing your heals. Pack no fewer than 10 beefy human food smoothies. Human food will increase your damage resistance. Honestly, 10 is probably too little. 15 or 20 is better. You'll also need a bandage to pop right before you start the fight. As for meals, Black Ox Burgers for more health and defense, or Omelant or Quesadilla Antlion for thorns to turn the enemy's aggression against it. For your mutations, the most important ones in my opinion are Meat Shield, Parry Master, and Mithridatism to increase survivability. Cardio fan to keep your stamina up, and a new one, Shocking Dismissal, for a chance at stunning the enemy. You see, Shocking Dismissal grants you a 15% chance on each block to build up a charge. Once you have a charge, your next melee attack will apply bonus shocking damage and extra stun damage. 
This enemy is very aggressive, and you're going to be blocking many attacks, so the chance of this proccing are high. The Infected Wolf Spider combines the moveset of the Orb Weaver and regular Wolf Spider while adding some of its own tricks to the mix. It has six attacks. The first is a standard bite. It will pull itself up to the side before lunging at you for massive damage. This attack and most of its others are executed much quicker than you're used to. You can perfect block by pulling up your shield the instant it starts to lunge forward. The second is a charged lunge. This is the same as the regular wolf spider. It tends to prefer to use this attack when you're at mid to long range, but will still use it occasionally when at short range. The infected will pull itself up, hissing at you menacingly before leaning back and lunging forward with a critically and sometimes lethally damaging bite. This is well telegraphed and executed only slightly faster than the normal wolf spider. The perfect block, wait for it to lean back and hiss, get ready to block almost immediately after. Okay, playtime's over. The gloves are coming off now. Its third attack is the five hit combo that the wolf spider uses. But this time, it's executed with blinding speed and is near impossible to perfect block every attack. Backing up doesn't work either because the infected tracks you with each hit. The best strategy is to try to perfect block those first two hits, hold your block for the next two, and try to perfect block the final. Be sure to heal up because it's likely you've taken a lot of damage. Failure to block this attack will almost definitely result in your death. The next attack is a three hit combo. This is the three hit combo that the orb weavers use, but this time it's executed faster and each hit inflicts heavy explosive damage. Did I mention it's unblockable? Fun! You can't back away as each attack tracks you. The only thing you can do is to start chugging those smoothies. Are we having fun yet, guys? The fifth is a high jump. This is the same attack as the regular wolf spider, but a little different. It will lower its body down before leaping high into the air at the player, inflicting massive explosive damage. This attack can hit you even at far range and is completely unblockable. You just have to take the damage. Be sure to chug those smoothies. Its final attack is a spore mine. If the player gets too far away from the infected wolf spider, or gets below or above it, it will use this attack to punish you. It telegraphs this by raising itself up, curling its abdomen towards the player, and immediately lobbing a fungus mine at you. If the player gets within close proximity, this mine will explode for heavy damage. At times, the infected wolf spider may lob multiple mines littering the field with these traps. This is to reduce your mobility and punish you for trying to move around or escape. These mines are unblockable and inflict knockback canceling out any attack animations you might be in the middle of. So the best strategy is to stick close to the infected wolf spider for the entire fight. Okay, I know I've painted a pretty bleak picture here, but this fight is possible to win without cheese. First and foremost, that fungus charm will make this much easier. All of those explosive attacks that are unblockable will have their damage reduced by 75%. That is much easier to deal with. The rest boils down to a few things. Have you been practicing perfect blocks? Did you bring lots of beefy smoothies? And do you have the right weapon for the job to take it out as quickly as possible? For those wondering, it is possible to cheese the infected wolf spider. However, the developers have made this difficult. The normal strategy is to get up high and rain projectiles down on your enemy. Infected wolf spiders can jump incredibly high, giving you the scare of your life. There's only a few things you can climb that are high enough to effectively use this cheese. Make this cheese harder though, it can lob its mines at you for very far range. It doesn't need to jump up there with you. The mines make it difficult to hide behind immovable objects as well. It's still possible, but you're going to have to look elsewhere if you're looking for a cheese.
Orc creatures are special variants of multiple other bugs that start to spread across the yard after completing the Undershed lab. Most of these you will not encounter until the Javamatic mission, but some can be found throughout the backyard immediately after. The list of orc creatures include Bombardier Beetles, Fire Ant Workers, Weaver Juniors, Blackhawks Beetles, Dust Mite, Firefly, Fire Soldier Ant, Ladybird, and Tiger Mosquitoes. They're easily distinguished by the metal helmet with a glowing red light on top of their head. Their moveset largely remains the same, however they become much more aggressive and will chase the player for very long distances. All orc creatures inherit a 50% weakness to sour alongside their usual weaknesses. If you're simply traveling through the backyard or taking on the hidden lab, no special prep is needed to take out a random orc creature. Simply use the same gear you've always used to take out this enemy. Sour weapons will obviously help though. If instead you're taking on the Javamatic mission, you're going to face many, many, many orc creatures and need to prep heavily. Now this isn't a guide for the Javamatic mission. My focus is on how to actually fight and defeat these enemies. My guide should make that mission a lot easier for you though. You need to go into this mission with the best of the best gear. What I mean by that is completing your build or using your preferred tier 3 armor and weapons upgraded to max. Any build, any tier 3 weapon can get the job done here, but I'm going to list some of the best gear for the job. For armor, the best tanky armor is going to be bulky roly poly, sleek black ox, or sleek ladybug at plus 9. For bowmen, the moss set or antlion set with a sleek upgrade at plus 9. The marksman cap is optional. Mages, the black ox set with or without the wizard hat, all sleek at plus 9. If there's any other build you're following, be sure to follow their instructions to get your build to the end game setup. For weapons, there's only two native sour weapons in the game, the sour battle axe and the sour staff. Both are extremely effective here and are going to make the fight much easier. Be sure to upgrade it to plus 9. It can be extremely advantageous to upgrade a weapon to sour as well. Some good choices include the Club of the Mother Demon, the Fire Ant Club, the Toenail Scimitar, or the Ant Lion Greatsword. If you choose not to use a sour weapon, the Mint Mace or Mint Staff is going to be the second best option, as the majority of orc creatures are also weak to fresh. Bowman, make sure you have a Black Ox crossbow at plus 9, and a variety of different elemental arrows and bomb arrows depending on the enemy you're facing. Whatever weapon choice you make, just be sure to upgrade it to no less than plus 8. If you're using a one-handed weapon, it's a great idea to use a fire ant shield in your offhand, as the shield has a chance of reducing the enemy's defense. This fight is over 11 minutes long, during which you'll be facing a massive horde of orc enemies. So be sure to throw down a lean-to in the nearby area, have 10 or more beefy smoothies, I prefer liquid rage for damage, human food for added defense, or green machine for hyper stamina. Sticky questionable slop is also good for trickle health regeneration. For your mutations, be sure to save some room to turn on guard dog, I hope you've been doing the mixers. Spicy safety and whatever your other preferences are. Just know coup de grace and trapper peeper are really good here as you're inevitably going to be attacking a lot. Make those crits even more likely by prepping two meals of spider slider or larvania. This fight is going to get very hectic very quickly. Obviously you should have prepped many defensive walls to slow and funnel the enemies. For the most part, the orc bugs prioritize going after the batteries rather than fighting you. Take advantage of that by never attacking more creatures than you're able to take on simultaneously. While it might seem that your priority should be to take out the biggest creatures first, don't underestimate the dust mites. They gather in large numbers and can attack very quickly. Due to their small size, many can group up in front of your defenses, shredding them down. The other bugs you should prioritize are the tiger mosquitoes, fireflies, bombardier beetles, black ox beetles, and ladybirds. Each of these possess their own unique high level threat. Obviously this is going to feel overwhelming. If you've been practicing on each of these enemies and feel comfortable fighting them one on one, it's going to dramatically increase your chances of succeeding. 
build lots and lots of defenses. Fight smart and aggressively and prep many heals and you're going to come out of this the victor. I think we've done it! Though the situation did seem rather precarious for a moment there. Moss are 25% weak to fresh, sour, and spicy, but 50% resistant to salty, busting, slashing, and generic, and are completely immune to dust. Moths are a formidable enemy with some new and familiar tricks under their belt, namely its bleed and dust effect. With the right setup though, you'd be surprised how quickly they go down. So let's jump into prep. For armor, use whatever set works for you. But if you're struggling, I'd suggest tier 3 medium or heavy armor at plus 7 or better to help you tank the attacks. Although Sleek Ladybug is great for the healing buff. If you can afford to do so, the Termite Chestplate will grant you immunity to dust. Dust reduces the player's movement and attack speed. If you can't use the Termite Chestplate, be sure to equip the Toxicology Badge as this will also grant dust immunity. You do need to be cautious though, as a few of the moss spawn locations are not the ideal battlefield. Here, it's better to fight with a dandelion equipped in case you fall. For weapons, the elements are your allies here, except Salty. The best weapons for the job are going to be the Spicy Staff, Sour Staff, and Sour Battle Axe. It's not resistant to stabbing or chopping, so the Rusty Spear, Tiger Mosquito Rapier, Termite Axe, or Scythe of the Blossoms is a fine option. Make it even better by infusing it with spicy, sour, or fresh to get in some bonus damage. Beefy smoothies are a must. I prefer Liquid Rage for added damage or Human Food for extra defense. Bring seven or more. At this point, I'm sure you figured out what meal you prefer, but as always, Spider Slider or Lorvania is great if you're using crit mutations, or Black Ox Burgers for more health and defense. For your mutations, Meat Shield for extra health, and other useful ones include Cardiofan, Parry Master, Coup de Grass, Trapper Peeper, and weapon specific mutations like Chopper or Lil Wizard. Daredevil can be useful in case you fall. In fact, if you have Daredevil equipped, you really don't need to worry about having a Dandelion. This is going to free up your slot for the Toxicology Badge. Be sure to throw down a lean-to, because if you die, it's going to be a pain in the butt to come up here to get your bag. Moths have three attacks. The first is a dive bomb headbutt. The moth will typically telegraph this by flying out of range. It will then quickly pull itself upward with its wings pulled back. It will emit a squeaking noise while gliding quickly at the player head first for massive damage. This attack is pretty easy to block. Perfect block by blocking right before the moth hits you. Its second attack is a dust cloud. The moth will fly closer to you and begin shaking back and forth before releasing a dust cloud with a wide AoE. The attack itself only hits for moderate damage, but what you really need to watch out for is the debuff it just applied on you. This cloud inflicts a bleed and dust effect. The timer on this debuff is reset on each tick your player is detected touching the cloud. Because of the small battlefield at each moss spawn, this attack is almost unavoidable. We need to minimize the damage in the bleed. And the best tactic to minimize the bleed is to be sure you have a bandage and sticky questionable slop active. You will still lose some health per tick, but it won't be nearly as bad without it. As for the raw damage, have your beefy smoothies on your hotkey ready to go. And don't forget to pay attention to your health bar as the bleed stays active for a pretty long time. Its final attack is a dust gust. The moth will typically start by pulling back to mid or long distance. It will then begin to flutter up and down on the air three times in a row, making a noise similar to gusting wind. On the fourth flutter, it will pull its wings aggressively together, smashing the area the player is at, with a dust blast for heavy damage. This attack applies dust, bleed, and will knock the player back, making it very dangerous as you can be thrown out of the arena. This attack is unblockable, and while it is possible to dodge, it can be difficult to do so. If you see the moth begin to flutter, 
Your best strategy is to run away in a straight direction until this attack hits. Be sure not to run near an edge. Hopefully you've made enough distance to avoid the attack. Much like the last attack, often the most you can do is simply tank it and mitigate the damage with bandages, sticky questionable slop, and some beefy smoothies. When it comes to fighting Moss, the name of the game is to fight aggressively and end the fight as quickly as possible. The longer the Moth is alive, the more bleed damage you're going to take. You see, the Moth is fighting a battle of attrition. Don't let it. The best way to overcome it is with heavily upgraded weapons to inflict massive damage each time you can get in an attack. The other method, which is my preference, is to use the Sour Staff to constantly barrage the Moth with charged shots. The Moth is very susceptible to stun. And when stunned, it will fall out of the air, landing on the ground completely vulnerable for a few seconds. Take this opportunity to wail on it before it takes off again. My only other piece of advice is to go in with plenty of beefy smoothies in case things go poorly. Once you've got strong gear in the right setup, Moss shouldn't give you much trouble. Ah, the infamous Black Widow. This bad girl can give even the infected wolf spider a run for his money. She's highly resistant to nearly all damage types, making her a fearsome ordeal for even the strongest players. She's 50% resistant to nearly everything. Fresh, spicy, salty, sour, and busting, chopping, slashing, and generic. However, she's only 25% resistant to stabbing. She's also completely immune to poison. I know she's highly resistant to explosive damage as well, but I can't find the exact resistance numbers. It's high, that's all I remember. The only damage type she's not resistant to is unarmed, as this damage type is treated as true damage rather than labeled as any damage type in the data files. I won't undermine the fact that she is difficult and gives many players a hard time. However, with the right prep, gear, and practice, she's not as difficult as you might think. For armor, this is largely going to boil down to preference. At this point in the game, I'm sure most of you have found a build you really like. It is worth noting though that some builds are going to be more effective here than others. Unarmed builds are currently the most powerful right now for taking out bosses in the Black Widow. Users should be using something similar to this setup. The Power Droplet Accessory with the mutations Lil Fist, Truffle Tussle, Coup de Grasse, Trapper Peeper, and Assassin. Along with that, the three pieces of armor would be sleek fire ant armor for the acid splash. Crit builds are also very good for hitting the Black Widow out of her attacks and inflicting above average damage. Bleed builds are also very good to keep some damage on the Black Widow at all times, thereby increasing your DPS. Here are some alternative options. You see, the Black Widow inflicts heavy to massive damage on all of her attacks. So medium or heavy tier 3 armor is a good choice to reduce that damage output. For melee users, this would be bulky roly-poly combined with a fire ant shield. The shield will help you reduce damage in case you miss a perfect block and it has a chance of reducing the Black Widow's defense. Win-win. Alternatively, another good melee setup would be sleek ladybug armor combined with a compliance badge. This badge is an accessory that can be found right here, near the power outlet by the hedge in the lower yard. This badge will heal you every time you perfect block, which is amplified by the sleek ladybug arm. In exchange, the badge will also cause you to take more damage if you fail to perfect block. So this setup is only good for players confident in their blocking skills. You can mitigate the risk though by bringing a shield, and the shield will take the damage of an imperfect block. For magic users, the fresh staff is in my opinion the best choice, but you could do this with a spicy staff as well. I like the fresh staff here because with the little wizard mutation on, it will reduce the movement and attack speed of the Black Widow. The spicy staff on the other hand can apply a burning damage over time, but its charge time is a little unrealistic in this fight. You'll be relying on the light attack, which isn't nearly as good. Boatmen have more options here. In my opinion, the best build for them is definitely the bleed by using the moth armor set. But even without it, they still have a lot of options as elemental arrows have been massively buffed in the 1.1 update. Mint arrows will reduce her movement and attack speed. Spicy arrows will apply a nice damage over time, 
and Sour Arrow's one flick increased stun, all of which are useful effects in this fight. Just be sure not to use any bomb arrows, as you'll probably just get yourself killed, as the Block Widow is going to be right on top of you for the entire fight. Bows are a decent choice now that they can block, as they inflict stabbing damage, which is one of the lowest resistances the Black Widow has. Circling back to the melee users, some of the best weapon choices include the Rusty Spear or Toenail Scimitar, both apply a nice debuff and are conveniently one-handed, allowing you to wear a shield. Or, two-handed options like the Club of the Mother Demon or Scythe of Blossoms, be sure you're using the mutation Apex Predator with those two. One-handed weapons are definitely the safer option as you can use that shield, but players confident in their blocking skills will find that the two-handed options will deal superior damage ending the fight quicker. On the flip side, some weapons that are very bad here are elemental melee weapons, like the Mint Mace, Coltana, Sour Battle Axe, or Salt Morningstar. You're essentially doubling her resistance to your weapon by using these choices. No matter what setup you choose, make sure you've upgraded all of your gear to no lower than plus eight. Plus nine is preferable. For the rest of your setup, it's going to be similar to what you've heard from me a million times. Be sure to pack a couple of bandages, one to pop at the beginning of the fight and another at the end. The fight is all about endurance, so you need to go heavy on your smoothies. Ideally, 15 or more beefy smoothies of your choice. I like Liquid Rage here for more damage, but Human Food is another good choice to reduce her damage. A meal goes a long way here. I strongly recommend Spider Slider or Larvania for increased crit chance. Crits are very powerful here as they stun her out of her attack animations. As for mutations, this really comes down to the build you're using, but always save room to turn on Mithridatism. While the Black Widow inflicts Venom, which is a more deadly poison that bypasses the Mithridatism mutation, what many players do not realize is she's also applying poison. This poison is more deadly than the Wolf Spiders, as hers can stack multiple times in addition to the Venom. So be sure you have this mutation on, or you're in for a world of hurt. As for the rest of your mutations, it's really up to you. But if you're not following a build, here are some good options. Good Grass and Trapper Peeper for more crits and more damage. Meat Shield for more health. And Parry Master to widen the parry windows. With the 1.1 rework to weapon mutations, most of those are also very effective now. Before we move into her attacks, there's something else you need to do before fighting her. You need to make sure you've killed all of the Black Widowlings first. Failure to do so is going to make this fight so much harder. The Black Widow shares the same attacks as the Orb Weavers and Wolf Spiders. They simply hit much harder and are executed slightly faster when she's at low health. Seriously, if the Black Widow is giving you a hard time, you need to practice blocking Orb Weavers and Wolf Spiders until you have it down pat. This fight is very simple once you do. She has four attacks. The first is the Orb Weavers three hit combo, but this time it's executed faster. It always starts this attack by leaning towards your right side, then sideswiping you from the right, then biting you from your left, then raises herself up, lunging at you with a heavy bite that is slightly delayed. The first two hits you need to block just as the attack is coming at you. These first two hits are timed in perfect rhythm, making it easy to get the timing down. For the final attack, pay close attention to the Black Widow, trying not to block too early as this attack is slightly delayed. The second is the Wolf Spider's Charged Bite. The Black Widow will push herself up, hissing at you menacingly, before leaning back and then lunging forward with a critically and sometimes lethally damaging bite attack. Again, this is another well-telegraphed attack that is easy to perfect block. As she begins to lean back after hissing, get ready to block almost immediately. The third is the Wolf Spider's Bite that comes from the side. Depending on your position, she's going to lean sharply to her left or right before lunging at you with a bite for massive damage. This attack is a bit faster and harder to react to. 
Just look for that tell where she pulls to the side and get ready to block right away to execute the perfect block. The fourth and final attack is her most devastating, the Wolf Spider's five hit combo, which has very little wind up, making it tricky to react in time. Each hit inflicts heavy damage, but if you fail to block the full attack, it's almost always lethal. The Black Widow starts by putting all eight legs on the ground and immediately raises her front legs on your left, quickly coming in for a bite from your right, then left, then right, then left again, and finally pulls backwards, charging up a strong bite with a slight delay. This might sound overwhelming, but it's really not that bad. Block the first three hits with perfect rhythm, the fourth is ever slightly delayed, and then delay blocking the final fifth hit, and you will successfully perfect block the entire attack. The more conservative choice for those that are not good at blocking is to hold your shield up to block the first four attacks and attempt to perfect block the fifth attack as this is the one that inflicts the most damage. As I mentioned earlier, this is a fight of endurance and to a lesser extent skill. The more preparation you make before going into this fight, the better your chances are of winning. Don't slack off on your prep. Make sure all of your gear is upgraded to max. Bring an overabundance of beefy smoothies. Do eat a meal. Make sure you've got the right mutations on, especially Mithridatism, and kill all the Black Widdlings before engaging the big girl. The rest boils down to practice. If you're having a hard time surviving the Black Widow's attacks, it's time to go back down to basic, guys, and work on your blocking skills. Sit in front of a wolf spider and orb weaver and do nothing but block. In this point in the game, the wolf spider's and the orb weaver's damage output is going to be pathetic to you, so don't be afraid to do this. Having a team can be helpful here too, but there is some problems with this strategy. The main issue is that the Black Widow, like all creatures in the game, gains more health the more players fighting her. Ideally, I wouldn't go into this fight with any more than three players. Otherwise, the amount of health she gains is ridiculous. Have one player as a dedicated tank, while other players wail on her from the side or behind. Be warned, she can switch targets pretty quickly, so everyone on the team needs to be ready to block when necessary. Keep practicing, guys. With careful prep and practice, I know you've got this. Before you know it, you're going to be taking out Black Widows without much fuss. Happy hunting. Well, it's been quite an adventure working our way through all these bugs and creatures. I learned a lot while making this vid, and my hope is that you've learned a lot as well. Combat doesn't come naturally to everyone, and some creatures in this game are quite difficult. My sincere hope is that I've given you the confidence and tools you'll need to succeed in fighting the game's enemies. Depending on the popularity of this video, I have been considering making a guide on all the bosses as well. Let me know what you guys think about that in the comments below. As always, if I got anything wrong or missed something, be sure to let me know in the comments as well. You'd really help me out? Click that like and subscribe button, show me some love guys, and give me some motivation. See you all again next time.